Uh, this is the Curriculum and Evaluation Committee meeting. It's Tuesday, November 28th. We are in the Administration Building, and it's 535. Um, the, um, Mr. Kaufman will take the roll. Um, Mr. Kaufman's here. Ms. Van Twyver here. Ms. Mm -hmm. Mrs. is here. Uh, Dr. Mosley, Ms. Van Patrick, Dr. McKinney. No Mr. Donovan tonight. Uh, Mr. Farrington from the board. And Mr. Hollowell. I think I saw Mrs. Odin, right? Odin, yes. Yeah. And lots of dignitaries. So thank you all for coming. Um, Dr. Mortaki's on his way. He's running late. Okay, the um, program tonight is the high school program of studies, changes and additions, and then we're going to review the SBAC, the NECAP, and the iReady data. And so. Um, You'd like to start Actually, and introduce the people? Actually, oh, we're, we're, we're live. Uh, we're working on it. Oh, we're not live? Yeah. 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 I think we should. <laughs> From the beginning? Just for the I'll keep the time. So yeah. It's on now. Okay. Uh, this is Mr. Kaufman. We are at the, it's Tuesday, November 28th, uh, 5.35 p.m. Uh, Dr. Mortaki is running late. Uh, Mr. Kaufman <coughs> is here. Ms. Van Twyver is here chairing the meeting. Ms. Hoency is here as well, as is Dr. Mosley, Ms. Fitzpatrick, Dr. McKinney, and also from the board, Mr. Farrington, Mr. Hollowell, and Mrs. Odin. Hey, Dr. McKinney, you're on. <laughs> so we have the directors of guidance, uh, Mrs. Kutu and Mr. Brown, and I think they're going to begin by uh, speaking a little bit about this process and then introducing the lead teacher. So, where is he? There he is. Hey, here. Thank you. So, thank you again for having us back. We, um, we do this annually, and I think that this is an important piece to what the Nashua curriculum is all about, in that each year Nashua gives the subject matter experts and the faculty the opportunity to uh, review the curriculum make recommendations, make changes, um, broaden the spectrum for students in terms of what the what is described and what they're reading in our program of studies. So Lori Kutu, the director from South, and myself are really here as MCs tonight. Um, to uh, This year we decided to bring out our subject matter experts, our head teachers in these, um, these areas to discuss the proposed changes. Um, again, this is a valuable process that we go through annually. Uh, we look at each course, the name of the course, the description of the course, prerequisites, what level it's at, how many credits, what does it cost to the district. So it's an important piece for the board to engage in, also for the public to be aware of. But more importantly, this is our primary piece of advertising to our students. When we roll out that program of studies, the footsteps uh, document, which is you know, bound each year, uh, we we provide this online and it gives our students the opportunity to look at what courses they're taking, what they're engaging in, what requirements they'll meet and everything like that. Annually, and this is, this is something that's I think beneficial about our district, is that we ask the people who are teaching it to uh, review it, come back with changes, improvements, whatever they may see. What is going on in the world that you teach that is not captured in, in print and then offer us those changes. We then bring those changes to the board and um, offer them in the form of proposals, whether it be name changes, course description changes, prerequisite changes, um, or items of those nature. So Lori and I are happy to, this time around, bring our, our experts to talk on our behalf. Um, and so we'll be uh, introducing head teachers, the head teachers will be introdu introducing themselves to um, bring to you the, the proposals that they have for next year's program of studies. We start alphabetically with the spreadsheet that I believe you've all received. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to start with Art. Okay. My name is Megan Durden. I am the Art uh, Department uh, Coordinator K-12. through uh, for the high school this year, we had a number of name changes. Uh, we ran into the problem with our sequential classes. We had Art 1, Art 2, but then no Art 3. 
So we decided to change the name courses so it would be easier for students and for parents and they're looking uh, through the course description to really kind of figure out what the, the course is about and what the, um, what the next courses could be in, um, in their students' um, career. So um, the first one, Art, Advanced Art, um, doesn't have a name change, but it has a description change. Um, and that was done by the teacher who teaches the advanced art class, and it was really just kind of um, paring it down and you know, just redescribing what the, the students will be doing in that course. Uh, we had a digital photography class, um, and instead of uh, calling it photo one and photo two without having a photo three, we decided just to do a um, advanced photography and a regular photography course for that. So um, photo one went from photo one to photography and then photo two is just advanced photography and that was just a simple name change. Um, the art appreciation course uh, didn't get a whole lot of um, interest from the students and a lot of times that course didn't didn't run even though it was a great way for students to get their quarter credit um, or their half credit in art um, and it kind of was just a summation of um, art history with some hands-on activities. Um, so we changed that from art appreciation to the art experience with a little bit more of a uh, more exciting description of what that, that course is about. Um, next we had art two. So we figured because we don't have an art three anymore we um, would have our advanced drawing class which would come after our drawing class. So art one went from art one to just being drawing and then art two went from art two to advanced drawing. And uh, we realized through uh, our description that it really was a more heavily drawing class. The kids went through a elements of art and principles of design, uh, but it was more heavy in the drawing department than, than anything else. The next one was uh, the AP Studio Art, and that just had a uh, slight description change. Um, it was talking more about um, the AP test that is done in the, uh, in the springtime and what the um, college requirements uh, were for that course. Um, ceramics, uh, which was previously pottery, is just pretty much we changed it from pottery to ceramics since it wasn't just about, you know, creating pots and vases. It was more of a sculptural class. So we uh, changed that name to ceramics and just kind of streamlined the description of that course. And I think that's it. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes, I do. I, Mr. Brown commented about cost, and we have a column in the far right-hand column. So I'm curious, because I'm trying to understand cost. Okay. And so what can you tell me about cost? I am not sure exactly what the dollar amount is for each school. I believe that's up to the principal's discretion. Um, so the art department is given a... Uh, a course for uh, a cost from the principal of how much they can spend on materials and that's divided up based on the the course and how expensive the materials are for the course so is this cost to a student nope. is this the cost nope. to it's run cost, the course it's just cost yeah. from for supplies and that's um, by the principal and if so I this, is, you, this is there's no new cost this is these no, are really I'm, just I'm, nominal descriptions. So the no. ceramic course, same as the pottery course. Okay. I'm trying to understand what it costs to deliver a class in the school. So you have overhead, you have lights, you have building, you have mm -hmm. teacher salaries, you have everything. What does it cost? So in other words, uh, and eventually a per student cost. So, and what I would appreciate is two things. One is I would like to know, are these, are these car courses yeah, quarter courses, or some of them are full semester. In other yes. words, could you indicate sure. on this which courses are quarter, half, full, whatever, I, so we have a sense of duration. And the second sure. part okay. is how frequently are they run? 
Are they just run in the fall? They just don't run in the spring or both semesters? Because I know in CTE we have, uh, you know, a very successful robotics program and it's only going to run once this year. <laughs> By the way, it got scheduled however long ago. So I would be help I would appreciate if that could be updated. And then my third piece that I would like to know is enrollments for all these classes. So the, the enrollment of requests or the enrollment in terms of the course size and how many courses are we offering? I guess I'm Help. wondering. So, say that again, please. So um, enrollment could be class size or it could be the enrollment of how many students are in each section um, or it could be the enrollment of how many requests we have for the course. So I guess I'm wondering what you're, what you're asking so for. So do you so measure all that. three? So we do. Then, then I would say please share all So there's a, just a couple things clarifying. I think that's a great definition. So enrollment capacity. There are certain classes that have capacity. So for instance, ceramic probably has a capacity of what, 15 kids? 20, 15, 20, 20 kids? Okay. 20? So, um, and then there are uh, requests. You may get a request to up to 30 students requesting the course. Um, and then the official enrollment is that's where it gets a little dicey because you may have uh, 30 requests, but probably 19 may enroll. And then through, through attrition, through students coming and going, through uh, preferences in terms of uh, seniors probably getting a, a, a more um, preference over, let's say, uh, a freshman, uh, you may get a class size of 20 exact or 18. Or in some cases, you may get a class size of two, which in that case, they wouldn't run the program. They wouldn't run that particular uh, class. They would close it down, that, that particular section, correct, close it down, and then they would uh, reschedule those two kids to another um, you know, section or, or selection. I just want to just clarify the robotics, please. Robotics offering, is it my understanding we offered it more than once, or just clarify that for We're me? We're offering it more than once at South, but once each semester. So I wonder if that's... That My information was about North. Okay. That it was only offered one semester. Marine robotics. Marine oh, robotics. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. I thought right. you were talking sorry. about robotics. Sorry. Yeah, different course. Students. My bad. Sorry. And that's sorry. based on the number of kids. Demand. Request. No, and, yeah, you know, so that, that's really, so is it about demand six months ahead to determine Yes. what you're going to do a year from now. Right? That's, why, that's why we go through this process to try to get as much information out to the kids who are subscribing to these classes as possible so that we can get accurate numbers when they do. So I would say as far as enrollment numbers for me or to the board would be the ones you use. And so if you use all three and if you can annotate how you use them, in, in other words to determine if we get 30 requests for a class that can hold 20, let's hope we can fill that and we now have perhaps some students who want it next semester. And, and there's lots of other things that go into it too. It might not be only request, it might be teacher load. Yep. So we might have numbers to run an additional class but we can't hire an additional teacher. <coughs> so those are some of our, those are some of the decisions we have to make. When let, let me share with you what yeah. is my question below the question sure. below the question is I'm thinking equity. Oh, okay. Okay, I want to understand equity. I'm trying to understand how much do we spend on our core academic courses. These kids, they have to take these things to graduate. Then we have AP classes that don't meet core graduation, but they meet graduation requirements, right? And then you have yet, what investment are we making in CTE? And then the remedial piece to help everybody get where they need to go. I'm trying to understand those components to understand where we're spending our money. So that, that's the question below the question. So if you have any in, insight into that, I'd love to I, know. I think just and initially my response was that this isn't a conversation about a change in cost. This, this isn't a conversation about how much these courses yeah. cost in terms of ceramics versus pottery. We're talking name changes and course description changes. I, yes, and I was those, just so going to say. cost would be the printed materials that we produce. That, that should be a topic for another question. meeting, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, thank be, you. I mean, you understand what he's looking for, I am. and we could thank probably you. have that at another curriculum meeting, but as you said, this is to improve the footsteps. Mr. Mm -hmm. Hallowell. That's exactly what I was going to say. So. Oh, thank you, Mr. Hallowell. Okay. All right, so now we're on to the um, Women as Heroes, is that where we're at? English department, yes. English department. And I'm <coughs> Susan York, uh, head teacher at South for the English department. And um, we have one very small change. 
The Course Woman as Hero has been in place for 20 years as one of our uh, elective offerings. And over the past few years, we have had a number of students who have um, mentioned to our guidance counselors that they wish they could take Woman as Hero, but it was offered at the honors level. The honors level might have been a little bit intimidating to them. They loved some of the, the topics and materials that were part of the course, but they weren't sure that they could handle um, the pacing and the rigor of the course. And so we have um, decided that it would be lovely if we could offer the course at the extension level as well as the honors level so we could have more um, equity for, for our students who want to take this course at, at various levels. We um, have a need for our extension students to have um, a wide variety of electives open to them because um, this is their, often they take their senior English credit, their fourth English credit, as an elective credit rather than um, taking English four. So we want to have a, a variety for them to choose from. Um, I'd like to let you know that there is no financial burden associated with this level change at all. We have texts within our department that we can uh, use in the extension level. A number of the texts will be shared between the two levels and we have some additional materials that we can um, repurpose from other courses or that we can uh, find short stories and uh, poetry in our anthology to meet the needs of our extension students. So there's no um, financial burden <coughs> at all that goes along with this. Um, to uh, answer your question, Mr. Kaufman, typically the Woman is Hero course at the honors level runs um, one to two sections per year itself. Um, if it runs in two sections, we like to ensure that they run in opposite semesters so that we only need one class set of books and we can use them again the second semester. Because this course has been in place for a number of years, the only cost associated with the course, other than all of the overhead that you mentioned, mm -hmm. is for replacement copies of texts um, or of books. We use mostly trade books. They tend to be paperbacks. Um, think about a paperback book that you've read five times and how it becomes um, a little dog-eared and not in great condition. So every now and again, every few years, we do need to replace some of our books. But that's relatively low cost because we're buying trade books and we're typically buying them at a, at a deep discount because we buy lots of them. So is that typically paid for out of the discretionary funds the principal would have? Yes. Uh, the principal typically um, lets or gives the um, department heads a certain amount of money to spend on the department as he or she sees fit. And then if there is a need for more money, then we have to go and sort of plead our cause. I'm glad you brought up the fact of books because we've heard that a uh, number of times that our books are really out of date. So you may all be thinking about whether books need to be replaced. You're working with up-to-date stuff. It's, con not it's that, a constant Not struggle. that the budget yeah. committee would love to hear that, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's uh, important, I think, that we have current books. <coughs> okay. Elizabeth. Yes, <coughs> Mr. Hatton. Yeah, so I just had a question. So when, sure. you, when, when it says level, I think what I heard you say is, so it's, you've added extension. Yes. So that means you'll run a course that's just extension students, and then you have a course that's just honors students. Not that you're mixing that is them that is our goal and our hope. Together. Yes. And then when it says on level, that's all levels of students. All in levels a together class. in a single class. And you might run, in this case where you have extensions and honors, you might end up running one extension class and two honors classes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I guess the next one is uh, calculus, huh? Calculus. Oh, no, Kathleen. Oh, oh, Kelly Gabriel, yeah. um, math teacher at South. Um, we're proposing a um, full year of AP Calculus BC. Currently, we offer a full year of AP Calculus AB. And what that means is there's a limited number of topics that are covered in that full year. And then, additional to that, we currently offer a semester of AP Calculus BC. And those are additional topics. So students cover AP Calculus BC currently in three semesters. We'd like to propose that there are some students, and I would say it's not a huge population, but we do have a population of accelerated students that could 
um, complete the, the BC topics in two semesters. So we're um, asking for a course that just constitutes a full year of all the topics that we currently cover in three semesters. Um, my, my thought is we would probably have about 12 or 15 students at South and one or two at North just from um, conversations with students. And um, this is no cost. It would actually be a repurposing of students. So students that would currently take AP Calculus AB in the full year who are um, able to, to handle the, the pace, the advanced pace, uh, those students would go into the full year of BC Calculus and not take the AB. So it's just a repurposing of students, um, not an additional class, although it's an additional class in the program of studies, if that makes any sense. Oh, I do have one question. Yes. If I so the, uh, you said there may be one or two students at North. Right. So we, or do they get the opportunity to take that class? If, if the schedule allows and uh, they travel, they would have to travel to South. But according to the uh, head teachers <laughs> at North, um, the, they thought maybe, you know, a handful of students, <coughs> if that. Okay, I'd like to say that Dr. Muratake has arrived. <laughs> and he... Ms. Twyver will continue to chair at least as part of the meeting. But Dr. Muratake, this is your last chance. <laughs> no, I don't. I think there's one more, right? Do you have another meeting I before think the end of the year? there's one more meeting. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. And now we're up to accounting fundamentals. I'm Kathy Tremley. I'm the head teacher at National Technology Center South, and we have a number of changes that we are proposing in the business department and some of the career technical education programs as well as one course in our technical program. So the first change is our current accounting course. Right now we have accounting one, which leads into our college accounting class. Um, the gap of the skills of the students in the class has really, um, it's an unleveled course right now. So it's been very difficult because you've got this wide range of kids that are in this course. So it's hard for the foundation students that are in there to continue on to the more advanced corporate topics that we get into. So we're proposing a new accounting fundamentals course. It's really going to slow the course down, teach them the basics in a sole proprietorship, and maybe get into some of the more advanced concepts that are going to be in there depending on how the course goes. Um, so this gives them the time to really truly understand the topics and the theories. <coughs> and now we'll have an accounting course, uh, College Accounting 1, which will be an honors level course that will now give students an opportunity to move at a more advanced pace. And we are, we're working with Southern New Hampshire University to get college credit on that course as well. Too. <coughs> One of the things that happened with our monitoring report four or five years ago with the state was that we were written up that it went from accounting one to college accounting. It wasn't like accounting one to accounting two or college accounting one into college accounting two. So I think this addresses the issue with the monitoring report and will take care of us when we go into the monitoring next year with our CTE programs. Um, there's no cost. We can use the resources that we have right now in the course. Um, for the business department, for the most part, it was um, a lot of um, looking at our course descriptions and our course names and just modernizing what we're doing in here. So advanced accounting, um, we were adding an honors level to that and then just changing the course description. College accounting now becomes college accounting two with a new course description change on there. Um, desktop publishing, because there's college credit in that course, we were adding an honors level and a course description change. Um, our current financial services program, um, we decided that it would be better to change the course name from Financial Services 1 and 2 to Business Finance 1 and 2 because um, it just felt like it, um, it just was a, a better name for us. Um, these were very long course um, descriptions that were in the footsteps, so we shortened it up. That's what our goal was on the business department, was just try to get the descriptions to like about two sentences, really short and sweet to get the point of what the heart of the course was. Um, money sense, we're going to change it to personal finance. We just feel like that that was a much better name for the course on that. Software applications was just a course description change. And sports and entertainment marketing, we wanted to add an honors level because we can get college credit in that course with a new course description change on that. 
So those were the business department changes, and the, and the business department teachers we got together a couple of years ago. So this has been an ongoing process for a number of years. Yes. Thank you. So I'm curious, do you folks cover like QuickBooks or some equivalent program in the Well, accounting? we did. Um, we do a similar program. Um, so the QuickBooks. We did try and get it in the Perkins grant. We did have it like five or six years ago. It was a nightmare to implement in the classroom. Um, the files were huge. Um, once you save on it, you have to have IT copy on, um, re-image the computers every single time the kids use it. And when you got a couple classes in there, it was really, really difficult to um, really make that an effective program to use in the course. However, we do have similar software that gives them the idea on how to use accounting software and how it is used in industry. And they do simulations on that software. Okay. I remember, I, um, I forget her name, Sarah Rose, was it? That's Hop Publishing. I was on her um, advisory board. Yep. And we talked about, and this is desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and a lot of uh, digital. Uh, design and visual. Digital design and things like that. And we talked about uh, getting the Acrobat, or excuse me, the Adobe Suite, software suite in there so the students could use it and take benefit of getting the Adobe certifications as part of their work here at high school. Is that still in the mix? They do use Adobe in the desktop publishing course, and I believe in the design and visual communications, they're using it as well, too. So, but are they eligible? Are they working toward getting the certification as part of the coursework? I am not sure on the design and visual community. Desktop publishing, definitely not, because it's only a semester class. Um, design and visual communications, um, I, I believe that would be something that they were going to, if it was part of her advisory meeting. And she was going to add it to the grant, but I have no idea if, because uh, there was a software investment that was required. Well, I'll just, I'm Mary Ann Dustin, and I'm the CTE director at South. Um, one of the things that we do with the, our um, Perkins funding, as well as the capital reserve, was we support all those soft grade, uh, software upgrades. I know that we have extensive Adobe usage throughout the CTE world and the um, business world in our, in our environment. Um, as far as the actual certifications, that is something that we are looking into. We've had a faculty change uh, in that program, and so that implicates uh, how quickly we can turn that around because we have to wait for that person's credentials to align with what Adobe expects as well. So we are looking at it. It's not in the program of studies right now. Um, that would probably be an update for next year to state that right in there as to the certifications that are available. Well, yeah, I th my own personal, I think if we can offer CTE programs or even accounting or whatever, and students can walk out of here mm -hmm. with a certification that's recognized as Cisco, right. like mm -hmm. you're doing it down in South. Those kids are going to walk out of here that get sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, knowing how to program those switches. So I think we should be offering that capability every place we can. And and that's certainly the goal because that is the goal of the state and the feds. So if do we you receive those monies? Do you have some kind of a document that you can share with me that talks about the curriculum and CTE that? indicates where, the, I know cosmetology, 16 certifications, mm -hmm. okay, but I really don't know what is yeah. everywhere else. I, I think that's a big promotional piece right. to the capabilities of the program, and I think we need to promote that. But as a board member, I really want to understand that. Well, we certainly can look at that with the UBDs with the new instructor, because again, looking at um, how her credentials align, uh, one of the things we may need to do is invest some Perkins funding for her to receive the training and receive the train the trainer certification. And um, I know we spent quite a bit of time today looking at Perkins money and, and repurposing a lot of the, those funds. Thank you. Dr. Muritaki? Yes, <coughs> I've got a, a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So in the, uh, in the notes uh, column, I noticed that a number of these classes are marked either meets ITC requirement or meets ITC and math experience requirements. Mm -hmm. So uh, could you explain what those are? What is the so ITC requirement? ICT is that the student, every business class is in a computer lab, so our students are able to earn their computer credit 
through those courses. So okay. for accounting, they get their computer credit plus their learning okay. the accounting. So they're getting two birds and <coughs> one stone. And because I believe the new requirement for math with this year's juniors, they have to have a math experience in each of their four years of high school. Okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be a math course. Right. It can be a math experience. Okay, so what we're talking about here then are satisfying some of the new high school graduation requirements in the state standard. Right. Okay. Uh, that's actually very good. Do any of these classes help to satisfy the Algebra 1 requirement? Not at this time. Not at this time except for Not yet. what we're okay. piloting. We're working on that. And I also noticed that quite a few of these courses are level or are either unleveled or they are unleveled and honors or unleveled and actually maybe beyond that. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the uh, comments that we had received earlier was we really need to work harder on having unleveled courses. So is there a requirement in the, in the state standard that we have unleveled courses in this, in this area? Or does this just simply help us to address school-wide the desire for unleveled courses in our in our curriculum? I would say it answers that quite. That's the answer. In, and so if I take, for example, a student who's in, um, let's say, an HVAC class. Mm -hmm. We can teach it at the unleveled uh, level, <laughs> and we can also teach it at the honors level. Part of the differentiation there would be possibly if the student was interested in accumulating the college credits at the same time. Okay. Um, so the teacher, it, it, it falls on the teacher then to differentiate the instruction, the assessments, many of the performance tasks. But there's also a, a lot of common soft skills, if you will, that would be expected of all students. It just might be the challenging, the different challenge levels of some of the, um, you know, demonstrating of mastery if you're at an un, a non-leveled level or an honors level. I'm especially intrigued with that personal finance course. Uh, you can take it as a freshman, mm -hmm. and it's an unleveled course, mm -hmm. and it meets the ITC requirement. Yeah. That could be a very useful course, mm -hmm. not just for life experience, mm -hmm. but it could also help to allow the student a little bit more flexibility and later. Mm -hmm. Thank and, you. Thank and you. We very tried much. to get ahead, ahead of the curve with that because mm -hmm. we had heard from the state board that they were looking at financial literacy being a requirement for graduation. So right. our right. business department did get invested in that and that's when we had money sense. But we, especially because we now have business finance, by having personal finance, the, the students really have better understanding of what they're going to walk <coughs> away with in that. And all of those finance and accounting courses and many of the business courses also align with um, the new partnership with Jean d'Arc Credit Union. One, one follow-up, sure. if you don't mind. So, in courses like personal finance, a lot of the students are probably going to be doing their personal finance on mobile devices, mm -hmm. like their phones and their tablets. Um, will they be permitted to use mobile devices for that class, or are they going to be uh, required to do them on like the classroom the use of mobile books. devices are strictly up to the te it's teacher discretion it's, okay classroom. thank you very much i'm done i have a question um are the, are all these business courses under the umbrella of cte or are they separate from it's, like cte and then yeah. then your regular so in the, well, in the business department, some of our courses are strictly like business courses and then some of them are classified as career and technical education. So your accounting course, um, marketing and business finance are CTE courses. Desktop publishing, software applications, they're business courses. We just call ourselves business just to make it easier. So some of them are in both. But Nashua Technology Center is business, facts, tech ed and the career and technical education. We have 65 different courses in our department. Okay. Uh, I find that kind of confusing. I'm Dr. O'Gara, mm -hmm. um, I was talking with her one time and she was talking CTE and I said, what's the business mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. under CTE? Because isn't she a, no, a regular, I don't want to say a regular teacher, but under the umbrella of, of the general curriculum. Is she? Um, 
Or was I she? I think she's a business teacher. Yeah, she's a business educator. But not under CTE. Under National under. Technology Center, she is a business teacher. She's not a CTE teacher at this time. It does not mean that she okay. has never taught CTE marketing or other courses. But at this moment, her, her courses are considered Nashua Technology Center business electives. I'll take that up with one of the <laughs> later. Okay. They're yeah. still confused. Yep. Okay. They're still confusing. Very good. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, I don't want to take a long time, but the, uh, could you explain a little bit the uh, association with the Jean d'Arc, uh, with the credit union? Do they just supplement what you were uh, offering before, or are they more involved? It's giving students um, that are interested in business accounting or finance, giving them that opportunity to learn the job of a bank teller. Oh, okay. But their curriculum also incorporates financial literacy topics as well, too. So we're partnering, partnering with them. They also offer workshops as well, too, that we're working with our um, sophomore teachers um, in the economics classes. So they come in and they make presentations. So they did um, the basics of banking, and they did a workshop on that. And then they have another thing that's Mad City Money, where the kids have to do a budget based on certain careers that they have. So we're working with them to help supplement a lot of the things that we're doing in our courses. I know at the ribbon cutting, they said they offer programs all the way down to the elementary Correct. different yeah. personal K through things. So 12. it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's interesting, the uh, course on um, budgeting on career, mm -hmm. type of career, because I attended a, a meeting down in Massachusetts where they did this on a uh, year basis for seniors, and I thought that was dynamite where they had to go and um, figure out, they give them so much money and tell them this is your career and how are you going to, how are you going to support yourself? I think that was the CU Reality Fair or something like that? Uh, well, I think it started in Quincy, but yeah. this was down yeah. in Plymouth uh, where they presented it. Yeah. Um, but I thought that was so dynamite and I was hoping that we could get that going there, but it sounds like this has been, they had some form of this before and now it's being reborn evidently. Yes. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Uh, to me, that is really great. <laughs> they have one person at the credit union that's in charge of the financial education, and they do the yeah. outreach to all the schools in the area. In Massachusetts, because that's where they were originally um, started, in uh -huh. Drake it and in Lowell High School, and now they've expanded to our high school here in Nashville. So. And is it uh, just starting, or has it been in wa for a while? I mean, how many do we have a lot of students taking that? Right they now we have, or they take two students in each block, and we have seven out of the eight positions filled for first semester. And we were crunched at the beginning right now. So our hope is we already got kids lined up for next semester. We have five out of the eight positions filled. We just offered it to the North um, Guidance Department because we felt like even though this is offered, at, it's at South and housed at South, we offered um, to the guidance um, staff over there um, for some of their students to have an opportunity, opportunity to do an extended learning opportunity mm -hmm. at South at the credit union. Is there any chance of making this required for graduation? How long is it? If <laughs> <laughs> well, the difficulty with that is um, the partner, the branch can only house Have so many, so many mm -hmm. students. Um, but and I thought it was also under the math program at one time. Well, was it there's a consumer finance course, consumer, consumer math. math. And um, what, what Kathy was describing is it's a component right within the existing curriculum for economics. We're just using a, um, a little bit of a different delivery opportunity because now we have the business partner. So instead of the instructor teaching all about banking, we actually have someone with that expertise coming in and planning and delivering a few activities as well. Well, I still think it needs to be a requirement. <laughs> the state does too. That's why they were looking at financial literacy. Ah. Uh, for our HVAC program, um, we want to change that to HVAC art because refrigeration is part of that industry and that's how they refer to it. So that was a minor change. And the HVAC um, R2, we're adding an honors level because there's an opportunity for college credits in that course. Mm -hmm. And then we come to manufacturing and machine technology. Formerly, we had uh, introduction to precision machining and um, an advanced machining program. And in discussion with our advisory committee members and some of the other activities going on throughout the state, um, and um, from some experience sitting at the uh, sitting on the 
uh, Governor's Advanced Manufacturing Council. Um, it's looking where we need to start looking at uh, it's not just purely machining, but how machining fits into the manufacturing process. And it's really more of an umbrella focus of manufacturing, but we have an existing machine shop. So I think you're going to see this is going to be something that's going to take a few years to completely transition. But for now, we want to look at what we have that's in existence as far as the competencies in machining and expanding that to the machining process and doing that at a year one and a year two level. Um, we're uh, opening this, this up, as you can see, to grades 10, 11, and 12. The hope is that the students that are coming to us from the middle school with the background in some of the robotics tech ed courses there, as well as the opportunities to take the VEX robotics or marine robotics when they get to the high school, can at grade 10 be ready to start this process. If they start as a sophomore, um, the hope is that as a senior they will um, actually be able to do an ELO at one of the local manufacturers. So the name change and some of the expanded description change is part of a bigger picture, which is the manufacturing pathway. Mr. Farrington has a question. I know this is a source of frustration for your side of the table, mm -hmm. as it is for me on this side and others. Do you have any really great new, lots of pizzazz kind of ideas as to how you get these kids to realize that there's a great career opportunity here? Well, I think the pizzazz factor is going to be slow for a little <coughs> bit here because of the, um, the implementation of the algebra embedded in with the manufacturing model. Um, again, we're trying to go slow so we can go fast later. Right now, the instructor that's doing that math and has gone to training to do the algebra applied in manufacturing, uh, we sat down very, uh, you know, at least once a month and we're talking about where are the students at. Um, the state of New Hampshire has sponsored manufacturing months. Our students were not ready to go. That was the instructor's feedback. Um, so we did reach out to those manufacturers. We will be having tours start of second semester before course selection. We're also hoping to generate some interest with an open house in the evening as well as an open house during the day. Uh, in the evening, obviously we want to invite families in. Um, some of the individuals who will help us with that are uh, representatives from the community college to showcase. And it won't necessarily be people like you and I, but they will bring some 20-year-old students what are you saying? <laughs> I, I personally know I can't, I can't sell it as easily as the students. And um, so that's the hope is we would have that as well as um, some representatives from industry setting up on some of our equipment. I know it's been a source of um, concern. The community college, I, I've spoken to them again. They will be coming in during their Christmas break, running our machines again. Um, and then we will be ready to set up um, a report a repair program for a couple of our Haas machines because obviously we don't want to fix them if we're not using them because then they'll be broken again. So we're waiting till we ramp up, then get them repaired and um, upgraded. So that's pretty nearly state of the art shop, if I recall. It wasn't that long ago that we right. bought new equipment mm -hmm. and that hasn't been used at all this year, has it? It has it, not been used. It's been run, but it has not been. No, I understand. So we're hoping to have them running and have students, freshmen and sophomores, come through there to see the hands-on activity. We're also using some 3D printers to, to work on generating some of that interest. Um, we've just invested some money in that as well, so. Great opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. So, thank you, George, for bringing that up. Uh, anything we can do with the other high schools? In, we're a regional technology mm -hmm. center, right? Mm -hmm. And we have students that I know they come down from Merrimack. Do they come from Hudson as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. So somebody told me that Hudson has some kind of a program that's using these machines, and they're at overflow capacity. Mm -hmm. So that's news. Is that not true? That's not accurate. Okay. No. Do they have a program? They do not have a machining manufacturing program. Just um, they have mechatronics at Milford, which is a little bit of a different um, approach. Um, both Milford and our original program and moving forward, our program will be articulated for college credit with the community college as well. 
So we mirror, we're parallel with uh, Milford. We just have a little bit of, they're more electronics and mechanical. We're looking at manufacturing and machining. And the Alvern, um, the high school over in Hudson, does have a, a CAD program yeah. that they run, but it's not, um, not the, the CNC. Not connected machine. to the machine. Correct. Right. If I could interject real quickly, um, part of the CTE um, initiative uh, in the state is not necessarily to compare and contrast, but really try to uh, work in partnership with some of our surrounding districts. So for instance, Mary and Dustin and Amanda, we actually attended the CTE, you were the, right, mm -hmm. CTE regional uh, meeting for, the, for this particular region. And so we talked about ways that we're not so much if they didn't have it, they're certainly welcome to come to to our, our schools and to take advantage of that. And conversely, um, if there's something that they offer, Milford, you know, Hudson, or Merrimack, we would be more than willing to talk about uh, that partnership as well. Um, I just want to be careful about a public meeting like this, like like the public uh, hearing that a, a certain school district doesn't offer something, because we really don't <coughs> know what they have in the pipeline. And certainly, we have to want to make sure that they have an opportunity to express some of their um, programs that they're proud of as well. Right. And, and we will be sponsoring um, to, again, generate some enthusiasm. We're working with guidance to have an open house for sophomores uh, in the evening with their parents to showcase all CTE programs, north and south. Um, so that's in the works. And just to piggyback on uh, what Dr. Mosley was saying, um, for example, Alvern will be having a, um, a welding program that they're putting in. So that will be a regional program that's approved. Our students will have access to that. Um, Alvern ha currently has the uh, heavy duty equipment, which is more diesel operated. We have the automotive program. So again, it's that complementary opportunity because it is cost prohibitive to have those big programs at um, to, to schools within the area for that. It's different than a marketing program, which is a, so it's expensive. Dr. Muratake? Yes, I just wanted to comment that uh, <clears throat> you're talking about the program at Alvern. Alvern also traditionally has been the, uh, the Aggie CTE group. Uh, we've been also doing things in areas like robotics and I, I think we're probably going to be getting into things like machine vision, maybe even drones. The reason I mention this <laughs> is that a big area right now, it's exploding, is drones and agriculture. Mm -hmm. It's big. It's, it's a huge growth area. And you know, if, for example, we were to one day in the near future have a collaboration between ourselves and Alvern, we do the drone part, they do the Aggie part, and we actually go ahead and mix those things. Uh, the graduates from that kind of a program could actually graduate with certified saleable skills <coughs> that could make them, in a very, very interesting career, a ton of money. Mm. And this is all cool. <laughs> this is the kind of thing kids like to do. So anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to all kinds of interesting things in the future. Mr. Cochran? Thanks. So I'm, I'm still kind of frustrated. It's a very large space. Do you know how many square feet Not off that particular of lab head. is? There's got to be, what, 15, 10, 15 machines? It's a huge space. There's at least 15 or 10. Yeah. So it's a very large space. Right. And it's apparently going to go unused for at least six months or a year with minimal enrollment or no enrollment. Is there something we can do in the meantime? Can you move those machines to one side because they're not going to be used? Can we bring, I, I believe if you had a drone 101 class, let's fly it, I, I've said this to James, and a drone 102 class, let's repair what you just broke, <laughs> we will have full enrollment and plenty of drones to play with. And that, it's a huge space, it's a lot of physical space, we don't have labs that are just available. So is that an option to perhaps repurpose that space somehow to bring something in there tentatively until the program gets its traction? Well, being involved in the building process of these two, these two new high schools years ago, uh, I know you needed at least two years lead time to get the equipment in there. Um, we have a lot of ele electrical work um, that 
possibly would have to be dealt with. Um, one of the things we tried to do in there is we used the classroom and converted it into a VEX robotics competition field, but now we have an algebra class in there because we're trying to have the students have visibility and an opportunity when they're learning their math concept and they can go and see how that's transferred to a piece of equipment. I don't currently have a machining instructor, so that algebra instructor can't run that machine. But I can get the post-secondary individuals to come in and work with those students so they can see the application and see them actually running. That's the goal in having an open house, running one during the day, one in the evening. Um, and as the students move in their algebra and have it, more maturity, just personal growth, um, and go out to some of these sites, for example, uh, Micromatics, which is right in the border over in Hudson. They have a lot of the same equipment that we do. Our hope is that if we can take them to the work site so they can see it in process, that will stimulate some interest. So they will be seeing their math applied, and then they will be able to come back and I can hire uh, or get a volunteer from the post-secondary college because I don't have to be concerned with safety and my algebra instructor is not going to get up to speed as a master machinist without a lot of years under his belt. So we have ideas. It's, you know, it's not, is it as big as we would all like it? Absolutely not. But I, I think we have things in place and I'm not sure that unbolting all of those pieces of equipment which are very, very heavy that would then have to be moved and stored somewhere. Some of them have if, if I may, and, and I hate to say this, I'm the last person in the world who wants to say this. I think I said it to you maybe the last time we were here we were talking about this is when, when you create a business, the first thing you do is you talk about how you're going to get out of business. And that may be totally intuitively incorrect, but it's actually just very true. So I have to challenge you that there's a time limit that we have this space is at a premium. We have an opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. If we can't fill this program in, say, two or three years, if your pipeline doesn't generate itself, I think the district has to be very critical of itself and say we gave it our best try mm -hmm. and that we, okay. So I would like to know if you have a recommendation as to what would that be? Uh, I, I think can we... I interject real quick? Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, think, I think the question is, what are, what are students interested in? That, that's the question. And I don't, whether it's a drone, whether it's, you know, an expansion of the robotics course, whether it's expansion of TV production, we don't really know. Um, but we do know what's working and what's not. And I think it's a fair question to have this discussion. Um, uh, my recommendation would be, and, and I guess I'm just going to put it, I'm looking at the two guidance directors here, is that um, I'd like to, you know, I don't want to survey to survey to survey out the kids, but just a, a no, no more than I would say a, uh, a one-page, ten-question survey and ask the kids exactly what they would be interested in and, and in that space. And I don't know whether it's a drone uh, program or not. I know that drones are very, very popular. There's also a sense of responsibility for that, too. Um, at the beginning of the year, when in the summertime, we did some, we did a, a tour of um, the Nashua uh, Community College and uh, developing some partnerships with the Nashua Community College. So I'd like to see, you know, if we talk about drones, there's the, you know, they have a beautiful facility where they have an a a aviation program that's connected to the college. So there's a great opportunity for that partnership to grow in a place like that. Um, the final piece to the CTE program, in my mind, is that I don't want it to be, I think there's an opportunity here to blur the lines. When I mean by blur the, blur the lines, I mean there are students that consider CTE very separate than the regular uh, curriculum or the regular classes that we have at the high school. And how do we, I'm um, just putting it out there, is it possible to create an AP drone course where kids can actually get AP credit for some type of STEAM or STEM program where, Mr. Kaufman, I know you, you made mention of a, I'm sorry, point. You oh. made, you made uh, reference to a certification. Can we offer a certification program at, at, at both of our high schools in collaboration with the CTE programs uh, and our regular curriculum? So I think there's a, some opportunities. I, you know, 
to have that wasted to, to have that space there, I don't think there's anyone in the room that doesn't disagree with you. We're just finding the right balance, and we can certainly talk a little bit about that. With I would like to see the principals here as well. Um, the next time we have that discussion, we'll, we'll certainly incorporate that. Um, but certainly, when we talk about the budget process, um, space, how we're going to use it in both high schools, I think it's a great discussion. If I could just add one thing, if you are going to do a survey and you're going to be asking students. Could you remember to ask them, we need to understand what their equipment is at home? This has yeah. a, been a, a board, so it might just fit very well. If you're going to ask them about one thing, you've got their attention, because we are concerned about equity and bandwidth and, and IT infrastructure, and that's a piece of the puzzle we're trying to find out. Thank you. Thank you. Well just, very just very quickly, since we're going to talk about this for a long time. I still, I drive by the signs in this community that say they're it's looking for machinists. And when I talk to you people about scheduling, frequently I hear the success of the pro programs determined by the instructor. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that person make a connection with these kids? Mm -hmm. Does the advisory council understand that they may have to step up and yes. contribute that person? Yes, they do. And that was a big <coughs> part of the conversation when we did the launch in May. We had a lot of manufacturers. We had actually quite a bit of um, representation and interest um, it's going to be it would be difficult because we're taking a person out of a productive environment mm -hmm. but as was stated in the presentation at the manufacturing summit by Dean Dean Kamen, basically it you don't step up step up and do this then I don't want to hear any more complaining because we have to all bring something to the table you got to we get have a, a facility right. we have um, the means to deliver the curriculum in conjunction with them. Um, and that's where we're getting to. And to your point is if it doesn't turn around in this group, mm -hmm. obviously leadership can make that decision, then it would need to be repurposed and the equipment would go back to the state for another center. And that's a sad thing. Uh, probably the hardest thing for me to do, but if it can be repurposed and meaningful and the students come out with certifications and an ability to have an, a living wage, then that's the decision we have to make. That there is a living wage to be made in manufacturing, a very good living. living. And I don't think we're done <laughs> trying to, to turn that switch and, and have the kids and the parents have that aha moment that this is. And my understanding is they are, as, this, as time passes, they're watching their current employees age out. Correct. Mm -hmm. And so it's a declining workforce that they do. Mm -hmm. We just, somebody has to find a way to make that connection. <coughs> Dr. Miratov? Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Actually, a, a couple of items, both short. About a half a dozen years ago, and I, I, I talk about this at least annually, a half a dozen years ago, my neighbor, a master electrician, approached me and said, David, you know, I belong to trade association and we've got like master electricians, master plumbers, master carpenters, may have master HVAC, and we've all noticed we have a lot of trouble finding people graduating high school who can take and, and pass the apprentice exam. It'd be really, really good if Nashua High were able to get a, a trades-oriented program going, and we've come a long way since then. But we still haven't asked my neighbor, the master electrician, who belongs to this trade association who would love to bring people in and talk to students about what kind of really nice, better than living wage opportunities exist in the trades. Are we ready to have me go to my neighbor and say, <laughs> hey, guess what? I think the school's finally ready to, to have you people folks you know, come in and, and talk to them. Or are we not ready yet? No, I think we are ready. And um, that's one of the other focus areas, is look, and this is throughout the state, looking at the, pro I call them the professional trades. We don't have enough students looking at it. Um, I think because I've explained that, you know, just as an example, if you're going to be putting up, we, we talked about this at the state, state house about half a year ago, in order to put up solar panels on your roof, which is a huge growth industry in New Hampshire, by the way, <laughs> the, the, the way this works is that in order to install solar panel on your roof, you need to have 
electricians that are certified by the trades, plumbers and carpenters that are certified by the trade. You have to have at least one master who is the project manager of that project. It can be one of several trades. But in every one of those categories, you have to have at least an apprentice doing the work and a journeyman supervising that phase of the work. There's a huge opportunity here in many of these areas, including electrician, plumbing, carpentry, and HVAC. And I believe that at least at this school, we touch HVAC and, 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 and electricity. We do. We have, we have building trades, which is constru right. constructions, so electrical, HVAC. Part of, so part of my frustration is that year after year after year, <laughs> I'm basically not knowing if I ought to go back to my neighbor and say, hey, neighbor, remember that offer you made <laughs> a dozen years ago? OK, so what I'll do is I'll actually go ahead and I'll chat with my neighbor and see if that offer still stands. And because we'd be happy to have them come in and do a tour, mm -hmm. see what we have and okay. what we might be able to and do. And it's not just him. to your neighbor. Oh, very good. <laughs> I certainly will. <laughs> okay. and, uh, and by the way, it's not just him. Apparently, he belongs to a trade association. And they would like to be having to do something with the schools in our area, including this, this school. Second question, and this is relating to drones, because it's a topic I love. OK, so if you are going to be doing drones professionally, and you're not working for the government, you're doing this commercially, whether or not it's you know, using a drone to take pictures of real estate, which is a huge market, using your drone to basically go ahead and contribute to uh, agricultural management, which is, a, which is a new and huge growth industry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You have to have a, an FAA Part 107 certification. So you have to be 16 years or older in order to get a FAA Part 107. And that FAA 107 is a valuable commodity to have nowadays because if you have one, any kid with a drone that's got a 4K camera on it can actually go into business working for maybe a real estate company to use his or her drone to take photos of homes. For, for, for money. And by the way, there's a lot of real estate agencies out there. There are a lot of farming organizations out there. There are a lot of tree management firms that have discovered that a LIDAR equipped, 4K camera equipped drone is exactly the thing to use for forest management. And guess what? We're 83% forest in the state and we have, that's a major industry. In the insurance industry. companies would love to have them too to look at your roof. Right. So the thing is, might that be an example? You know, it, a CTE course that teaches a student how to pass the FAA Part 107 rules exam, maybe a companion course that allows a student with their own, I just found in TechRabbit, you can buy a $100 Parrot Bebop 1 drone. That's a 4K camera drone with a 3D gyro-stabilized camera in the nose. This is a nice drone for a hundred bucks. That's, that's uh -huh. less than a phone. <laughs> Too, many Too many toys. Too many toys. A couple of phones. Yeah. Couple of phones. Well, it sounds like an area that should be looked into anyways. So yeah. I think there are opportunities, and I think we really, I'm, I'm happy to see all of this. Thank you very much. Uh, Mick, could we let uh, Ms. Hohensi speak? She hasn't had a question yet. And then Mr. Uh, Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to know, have you looked at the retired um, market for machinists? Because I'd stumbled into one last week, a retired machinist, and I was talking about our facility. And he was very excited, and I believe there might be others that um, might on a part-time basis come in and be able to help and they're very enthusiastic about their trade. So I'm sure we have a lot of well-trained machinists in our Nashua area. Well it's definitely worth looking at again. We did hire a retired machinist a couple of times. Unfortunately, um, depending on their own career goals, I'm not sure how long they're invested in, in growing the program and that I'm not meaning to generalize, but um, 
that has been a challenge. Uh, that could be another way for the industry partners to get involved. We do have some individuals who no longer want to, st st because of maybe medical or just desire to stand in front of a machine, but would like to do training and teaching. Uh, some of the things that make that difficult is in order to come in and be the teacher, they've got to leave their salary, their career, and then they have to come and start all over again, and they have to pass the praxis, and then they have to go through the whole uh, credentialing um, experience in three years to become a certified post -sec uh, certified secondary instructor in the state of New Hampshire. So if I can do it a different way, I would prefer to because that doesn't mm -hmm. make people want to run. Um, it's, it's very difficult to attract this, this level of expertise that we're looking for um, into, the into the classroom with the requirements to be an educator mm -hmm. as opposed to coming in and being a trainer. So it's kind of like I have to have, I could have a certified math instructor in there with this person and that was kind of the dream of going the direction that we were going is the certified teacher of record would be the math teacher when it comes to apply the math the professional master machinist is using that piece of equipment to crank out the product. So, well, I think there's I think there's an interest out there. Absolutely, and uh, I'm sure it, when they're retired, they have the time to put in, and I think they want to see our schools develop with the machine, the students picking that up. So I think there's it might be a good market to tap into. And also, are we going to eventually put out regional uh, CTE signs uh, mm -hmm. out in front of the high schools? Is that we'll let Amanda address that. <laughs> um, we have been working on that. Yes. Oh, great. Yeah, and I've um, spoken with, working with Mary Ann and Kathy, and also Donna Fitzpatrick, and we are, the ball is rolling, and we have, we're going to get quotes, and yes, we are doing that. Great. That's can't good. the, can't the, Shops build it. Can't the students build it? <laughs> first of all, I mean, I as an experience, they contributed. This is I their think that's song, always you know? a good yeah, idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. But first of all, I have to figure out where we are allowed to put it. And but we're getting all those pieces in place, and that is really happening. So I'm great. super excited. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Hellwell. Um, so it's great discussion. I might suggest, in the interest of time, that we focus on the business at hand, which is the actual changes so that we can move this along. Great, great discussion for the CTE mm -hmm. program to come in and have an evening to discuss CTE. Yep. Okay, so have you completed your? Uh, no, we no. have a couple more. The health next science. one is health sciences. Okay. Just in the, um, mainly in the description <coughs> is the change. One of the significant things that's gonna change with our program is we are no longer offering the EMT program during the day. Um, we are working with Lori Rothhaus and the adult um, and continuing education be offered in the evening so it would be available to adult students as well as our students. Um, and part of the reason behind this is basically it's almost impossible to get an instructor who's an EMT trained instructor working a day job with the fire department in the state to then come down and work part time to deliver the EMT certification for our students. And we, we, we had to look long and hard. Yep. And uh, we're very fortunate, and the person that's doing it with us right now may be the person who would, would bid on that opportunity. We do have a couple of other people that would be very interested in doing it in the evening, but they just can't do it during the day. So that's the change, okay. EMT you, during the day. Do you know, I forget Justin's last name. He's the CERT director. Gates. 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 C-A-T-E-S. He, he might be worth speaking to. He might have books that you might otherwise not know about. I mean, we are housing all his equipment at South, right? So I like that. That's the disaster center is South High School. In case of an emergency, that's where they'll yeah. switch you up. Yeah. That's true. We sort of train, so I remember that part. So on the, on the EMT program, if they take that at night, is that a course they get credit for? I think we'd have to work out all those logistics similar to uh, early college. Yeah, if they, were a, if they were a day student and they wanted to take the class for credit at the high school, sure, they could. We have students take courses through NCLL for credit all the time in the, for the day school. Okay, thanks. 
Uh, I guess my last change is actually oh, that we're, we're... I'm sorry, but on the electronic version that I downloaded, um, I wasn't able to see the EMT change. Did it have a different name? They took it out. It just, oh. it's not, uh, in, oh, right, right. in the description, it's no longer offered um, as an option. So where it said you could, students could um, basically select the LNA track or the EMT track, there's no longer an EMT track. Oh, okay, because I saw the cancel courses, Physics um, 2, Chemistry 2, Biology 2. Was that also in a cancel list somewhere? It wasn't a separate course. It was through Health Sciences 2. Right. So it was really a description change within Health Sciences 2. Okay. It was part of the content mm -hmm. of that course. Health Sciences 2. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Farrington? Just real quickly on the LMA portion, do you still have students that is applying and not able to get in? This is year we did have some that were not able to get in. Um, do you recall roughly the number? Well, we we had a wait list of yeah. 45 students at the beginning of the wow. semester, and I think we got a, quite a bit off the wait list. Yeah, I think we were list. down to about 16. Um, last year, the wait That's list between was the two schools? Yes, yes. and okay. area. And so if you offered it at the second school, there'll be, you'd have the demand, you just don't have the space for it. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Hallowell. <laughs> I've had several names That's to see. That's Bob. <laughs> I know. Um, so this is an area that I've always talked about, and you're, showing, you're shaking your head. I'm going to say it again. Particularly in the case where we know we have students from out of district that want to come here, they pay money to come here. And so if it's a matter of repurposing space in order to make space for this program, we ought to do it. Because we may find that there are other people that don't even bother to apply because they know there's an a wait list, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know whether there's any space that we can repurpose or extend from where we are in now, but... Don't see. Mr. Farrington has an offering. You should well, let him finish. Oh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I well, as part of the Brentwood Committee, that was a conversation before if the facility, if the it's a several step process, but if this became Brentwood, the administration moves somewhere, you've got a big enough facility, then the IT people can move out of the South High School and it's going to free up space to be able to do your second program. Or, or it's not, it's, it's, right. it's sim simpler to sit here and say right. it than it yeah. is to right. do it. But I think you have those options available as part of, of the larger concept of how you utilize your space. And so, since we had this discussion the other night, that's, if that's kind of possibility, might be. <coughs> The difference between what we do for Brentwood, right? So that should be factored. If we think there's a cost savings there, wrap it all together. So, can I speak to that? It, and I, it's a little bit off topic, but just let me say this: If you rebuild the middle school, Elm Street, you put it in another location, and you now have Elm Street School, which could become a destination for special ed, Brentwood, a community center. A huge place. Just throw it out there. All right. Let's then we don't have to pay okay. to tear it down. <laughs> it, it is on the radar, absolutely. Okay. Um, I, I think based on the number of students that come over to us and want this might the be class, my last opportunity to say it. So I know. I know. <laughs> and that's why I just want to make sure you know it is on our radar, and um, we know that it's a high uh, growth as far as the actual industry demand. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Nashville will be coming up for a renovation project in the not too distant future. Um, obviously, that would be something that would definitely be looked at to, I know we're talking less than five years out, to uh, maybe repurpose some space or add some. And then in the professional trades under electric, the our electrical program, we're just taking out the trades um, expl explanation and moving to electrical technology one and two. The description has not changed. The levels have not changed. The apprenticeship sign-up has not changed. Why the name change? Was it confusing to have um, the word trades in there? The instructor working with it, they just felt like they didn't want the word trades in there. They thought that technology was a better way of looking at it. Okay. Do you want me to do this one? Sure, go for it. <laughs> Um, so the only real change at North is um, 
the head teacher, uh, Chris, has asked that power mechanics previously was a quarter class, one and two, and um, it's open to ninth through twelfth graders. And Chris noticed that he was having students, ninth graders would take one, level one, and then he wouldn't see them again till um, you know, twelfth grade maybe when they would take level two. And he was having to reteach a lot of concepts because of this large gap. So he's just asking that we make it a one semester course so that he can teach all the concepts at one time. Um, and I also just wanted to say that uh, I think um, that our, the CTE department are, has been doing a really great job of really trying to reach middle schools. So that's you know um, a thing that's happening that I wasn't aware of. Now I've been brought in. A lot of the teachers are uh, the head teachers and Mary and Dustin. Um, they're really setting up programs so that the middle school students, eighth graders, can feed into some of these the tech courses and then go into the CTE courses. So there's a really nice um, developmental path that's happening to start to fill some of these courses. And I just think it'd be nice that everyone's aware of it. Yeah. We're building a pipeline. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think that technology, you know, is that catch technology, the marine robotics, the VEX robotics, and then into the manufacturing. It makes a lot of sense. So. Or engineering or yeah. Yeah. Dr. Muratake. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> so I've noticed that a lot of these tech courses are unleveled and they're offered to <clears throat> like 9, 10, 11, 12. Can any of these unleveled courses be taken again by a single student short of failing the course? Can they take it twice for credit? Yeah. No, only once. And I think they sort of see these, these as like the feeder, like because ninth graders and tenth graders can take these courses, they prepare them for the more, you know, the CT courses and the engineering courses. And if I may follow up. Sure. I, I know that in other school systems, <clears throat> a more advanced student is sometimes invited to come back to a course Mm -hmm. kind of like a, as a teaching assistant. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that opportunity available to national students? Yes, yes. we usually um, do that through an ELL experience. Okay, so that's how that gets right. counted. Is it mm -hmm. e an ELL, it's got a different course number. Yeah, ELL. ELL. Thank you. ELL. Extended ELL. learning right. opportunity. Right. Yeah. And, then we, and I do that in my accounting class. I have students who are saying, can I be your teaching assistant next semester? Mm -hmm. So I do do that opportunity, mm -hmm. and I give them the opportunity. Is that with students one-on-one, -on -one and if a student has been absent, sometimes that person will work with that student while I work with the rest of the class. So is that ELO also unleveled, or is there a possibility of unleveled, honors yes. credit? Unleveled. Unleveled. It's unleveled. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have just uh, the cancel courses to do. Yeah, we about no, science. Oh, science? Yeah. I'm here. <laughs> they should have put you in my room. I know. <laughs> sorry, yeah. sorry. Yeah. That's okay. So I'm Samantha Benzavenga. I'm the science department head teacher over at Nashua North. And I'm just here to briefly talk about um, anatomy and physiology as well as those cancel courses that you guys are talking about. Um, for anatomy and physiology, we currently offer anatomy and physiology 2 only at the honors level. We are proposing to open that up to the <coughs> extensions and foundations level as well. Um, we've been finding that more students are interested in taking anatomy and physiology 2. However, our current honors AMP 2 has um, a prerequisite of having taken honors AMP1 and achieving a minimum score of a C. So we're hoping that by opening this up and having another section or two, um, that more students will be interested in that, continue through um, with that, especially if they're interested in the health sciences. Um, yep, yeah. any questions? Yes. Is LNA, uh, the Different. LNA program, does it require this? I don't does not require it, okay. no. It's recommended, but it's not required. Yeah. And then um, for the course camp, uh, getting rid of some courses, we uh, spoke to the science teachers at both, both South and North about um, Chem 2, Physics uh, 2, and Biology 2, and just basically noticed that although we do get some interest during that course selection period um, in the year prior, it's never enough to actually run the section. So we're um, hopeful that by eliminating these courses from footsteps, this will channel those students into other courses that have a higher um, tendency of running. And then there's still the opportunity where if there's a student that's interested in something like this, they can do it through that ELO, that extended learning opportunity. Um, for example, I have a student right now doing chemistry two with me because it wasn't running. Um, so there is still the opportunity to do it through an ELO. It just wouldn't be included in the footsteps. 
Do any students for these canceled courses have any students and parents expressed an interest in VLAX as an op as an option? Because VLAX sure. offers those courses. Yeah, I'm not sure. And that would be another option if a student were to come to us and simply ask, do you offer this at the next step? We could say, well, here are your opportunities. You could either look into speaking to guidance about doing it through VLAX, or um, if you're interested, we could run an ELO for you. So there, it would be another avenue. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure about students that have expressed interest in that. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess there's one more thing, and that's the Spanish. Mm -hmm. I can speak to this, yes. So I'm going to be the uh, impromptu head teacher for world languages for both schools tonight in, in place of the uh, of Jane Wang and, and uh, Leslie Anton. Um, very, very quick, hopefully nominal change for you, one that I see a lot of value in. There are two courses on the books currently called Spanish for Spanish Speakers 1 and Spanish for Spanish Speakers 2. Um, the the numbers for the requests for those courses are, are seldom high, and they're, the the nature of the curriculum is such that we wanted to introduce, well, really we wanted to match the description to what the teacher is doing in the class. What the teacher is doing in the class is talking a lot more about heritage, culture, um, the differences in where people come from and what they've contributed to our country. Um, so Spanish for Spanish one. On the surface, we want to change it to Spanish for Heritage Speakers 1, Spanish for Heritage Speakers 2. It's a nominal change, but I think it really embodies a lot of the, the depth that the teachers are covering when we do run these courses. Mm -hmm. um, so it is a name change with a description change. And if you think back to last year when Ms. Kutu and I were here, a lot of the foreign language course descriptions were kind of jazzed up and, and made to be um, you know, a little bit more exciting and, and, you know, try to get people involved with, um, you know, the languages and try to increase those enrollments. This was, this is just a, a, a following of that and, and a logical one at that. Um, so I think that this, the description follows the depth of the course. It's not just Spanish language for people who already speak Spanish. We're talking about culture, we're talking about heritage and where these people come from and what they bring to the United States from their different countries and uh, having conversations one on one with the teachers and the head teachers, it's been valuable for our students. And I wish we had more kids that could take this course, quite honestly. And I do hope to see um, a section two run in the future. The one thing I'll note in, in, in the lack of time here is that the, the biggest change that I'll draw your attention to is a prerequisite change for one. So this goes from no prerequisite to a placement exam prerequisite. Mm -hmm. The rationale behind this on the, on the part of the head teachers in the world language department was really because they're, we try when a student moves into the district or when they register, they come in from ninth grade and they want to take a world language, particularly Spanish, what level do they belong in? Do they belong in one? Do they belong in two? If they already speak the Spanish language in their household, is one too elementary for them? Are they lacking certain uh, reading and writing fundamentals that would be better served for someone who we understand speaks the language in their home? So what this course does is it kind of customizes that a little bit more for the, the number of students that we have that come in. But I did want to very specifically draw that to your attention, I'm not just trying to pass a name change or a description change by you, but there is a prerogative change as well with the, you know, the world language department is taking it upon themselves to have a placement exam to determine is this person better off in Spanish 2 or 3 or are they better off in Heritage Speakers 1, Heritage Speakers 2. Thank you. Dr. Maritalker? Yes, thank you. I've got a couple questions. <clears throat> First is, uh, did we develop that placement exam internal to the district or are we using some standardized placement exam? I, I knew that you were going to ask that yeah. question. <laughs> internal exam. And the it's answer an is, internal one. it's Interest. an internal one, yeah. okay. And uh, the second question I've got is that, uh, this is ancient history, but in, in, in the distant past, my family supported um, exchange students from other countries, including, you know, like maybe Spanish. And we also, moved our kids out to, you know, some exchange programs. Mm -hmm. I even had a daughter who spent her junior college year abroad in Japan. And uh, 
and we en we entertain a, an exchange student in return. So the thing is, I think we often find that in a class like this, mm -hmm. like Spanish for heritage speakers, uh, it's a rich addition to have an exchange student actually taking the class with the students. Uh, this also helps to satisfy requirements for their own education while they're here. So do we have enough Spanish exchange students in the city? I've never seen a Spanish never. exchange yeah. student. Do we, are we connected to those organizations that actually help to host exchange, foreign exchange we students? We don't connect to them. They connect with us in Very multiple aggressive. phone calls. <laughs> Very aggressively. They and, and, uh, and, we, and we don't, we don't know enough students to actually go ahead and fold into one of these classes in the future because that well, would be kind of nice. I will tell you that we've had um, German exchange students very, not frequently, but that's our most frequent country that we're seeing exchange students from and right. they will go into the German classes um, and work with the kids, so, okay. or work with the students, so that is one way we are. Okay. I, I, I like this change, by the way. Good. I'd like to uh, kind of wrap this up if we could because we have another big topic on the agenda tonight. And I'll give you one quick question, Mr. Coffin. Thank you. Any thought to do this for Portuguese? Because we have such a large Brazilian good. community in Nashville. Yes. Um, we have not added additional languages, but um, you certainly. Is there a we demand? Maybe part of that having, survey might be. Yeah, it's hard to know. Languages. Italian. Japanese, you know, there's lots of students who take... I can get take, Chinese exchange students. It's very hard to we tell have lots of students based on take, what we offer. Not lots. We have a handful of students that take Mandarin through VLAX. So. Okay, <coughs> Mr. <coughs> Dr. Miritaki. Just One a, last question. Just a simple question. Is the administration <laughs> looking for a motion from this committee tonight? This, for this approval. Side? Yes. Okay, absolutely. in that case, uh, I move that this committee recommend to the full board uh, accepting the recommendations on high school program of studies, changes, and additions as presented by the administration tonight. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? You can thank print you. it. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. for coming, guys. Thank yes, you. thank you all for coming. Thank uh, you very much. Always love to hear about these things and the dedication for all you to take out of your night. Thank appreciate it. Thank you for all of your work. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. The next uh, topic is... Yeah, so, can I, are you guys waiting for the data yeah. discussion? Yeah. 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 If some of you want to take some of you, you all look cramped back there, so if you want to sit up here. Yeah. Motion to accept. Yeah, that's what was on the thing here. Motion to recommend. Thank you. 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 Thank are you going to move up, people, or are you just going to stay back there and see people? Your bits. Thank you for being so patient. Um, booking two heavy subjects of the same night is not advisable. I didn't do anything. I just sat Again. All right. Dr. McKinney, you want to start the review of these SBAP, NICAP, and IREADY data? Well, if I could just start with some things that are in the packet first. Uh, there was some... Sorry, playing music with chairs. Oh, that's good. Oh, no, I was going to switch chairs. I'd like to sit my computer. There you go. Sorry. Uh, when we spoke last time, we spoke about uh, data sources and um, the difference between formative and summative assessment. And one of the things that was included in the packet was an article about uh, formative assessment, what it is, how it's used in the classroom versus summative assessments. Um, so some of the formatives that we use in the classroom, like exit tickets or um, a ticket to leave that informs teacher's instruction and <coughs> gives a snapshot of student learning during the course of class. Uh, the other thing that was shared in the packet, which goes to our conversation from actually last night, was around um, sorry, data teams and a data protocol. So this is the district uh, protocol that's been in place for a while that is used at um, the school level that they review their data uh, with the principal and a team and even down to the grade level where they 
begin with predictions and observations, look at patterns and trends or impressions of the data, and then move to inferences, and then eventually coming to an action step and a focus statement towards um, a SMART goal for the course of the year. This is part of the planning that happens at the school and district level. Um, and these pieces are in place for some time now, but. I, I didn't want to interrupt you. I didn't mean to. Oh, do okay. That. That's fine. But I do have a question. Okay. Do you want to do um, it now? Yeah, this, this form is filled out uh, by the committee. Is the team correct? at the school level. And, yes. and they, um, the committee is, covers all levels. You don't have one committee for each level. Uh, it happens at the building level. At the building level. Yep. Okay. And how often do you get this filled out? Once a year? Annually. Yep. yep. And it's rolled up into a report, is it? Uh, so at, in my position, I would speak with the principals at the elementary level about this. Yep. At the school level, it would be presented at a faculty meeting, a review of data. These are the areas of strength and weakness, and here are the things that we're doing to remediate it. And is it shared amongst school to school? I mean, if you find out yep. that something, that information is shared, to see if it's a common problem across the district? Yep, so the curriculum team, the curriculum specialist K-8 would look at those sort of things, and even at the high school, of patterns and trends and alignment with curriculum. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm That's very okay. interested in seeing this because I was very surprised last night to hear that we had this going on, and I've, I don't believe we've ever had a report from, from the data group, but is that going to happen in the future that you'll come with us information? Yeah, I think that would be a healthy thing to do to have a conversation with that. I think one of the challenges is, I, you know, I've been here three years, and two years I've had two different administrations, and we've had a lot of people come and go, and with that we've lost some systemic um, knowledge and practices, and we're just kind of revisiting those, strengthening them, and putting them back in place again. So um, providing some leadership from central office and then revisiting those practices so the, on a regular basis. The curriculum committee in June would be able to hear this report? You can put that on the agenda. I appreciate the advance notice. Yes, we'll be back in June. <laughs> well, I want to give you plenty, because the date is important, so yeah. plenty of time. Thank you. Um, and then one other, two other pieces that were given in the packet. Oh, sorry, just wondering where David is. Oh, there he is. There he is. Okay. <laughs> uh oh. <clears throat> two other things that I thought was helpful. You know, data is everything and describes so many different pieces, but we should be looking at all our data. And I think there was some information that was passed from board members around um, X2, attendance, all of those things. So part of the, the leadership data committee would be looking at is all those data sources and what do they tell us? What are the trends? What are the patterns? So not only just demographic data, data about um, daily attendance, um, students are in crisis and homelessness and transitional housing moving back and forth. We've had an influx of students coming into the district who, you know, have been in unfortunate circumstances and come to us in dire need. We've also seen a, an increase in um, our ELL population. Um, I've been working with the ELL uh, department, Bob, Mr. Chopa and his teachers, and looking at the number of students that have been growing through the program and their needs. And as you can see over time, there's a large group of students that come to us with a large number of needs uh, that we're working to um, meet with um, a staff of 24 and over 1,100 kids, which is three times the state average, which I think um, speaks to the, the dedication of the staff in the Yale department. But the more and more we talk about testing and what the spring looks like, uh, these ELL students have a challenging time because they're taking access and WIDA testing. They're also taking SBAC, SAS, NECAP. There's a lot of testing that goes on for them during the, the spring. So, so another data point to consider uh, when we look at budget, we look at instruction, when we look at all these things, I think we should be looking at the whole picture. In that regard... Sorry, can we go back to that? Yeah. You can, yeah. yeah. So... We've had an increase. It, it looks a little bigger than it really is. One of the things the state did two years ago was they changed the cut score. I would say somewhat arbitrarily decided a number that makes it more challenging for our students to get out of the monitoring, or to get into the monitoring phase, to get in that level level one, level two. Mm -hmm. 
um, we had sent the board had sent a letter to the state basically challenging what what's your rationale and without really thinking about the impact on cities like Nashua that have a significant number of these students <clears throat> and I think if you go back and you look I think it probably was the 2013-14 school year if you take those students that are in monitor mode and look at how they do on the standardized testing those students are doing better than the average student in Nashua. So if you take out all the ELLs, right, we were, our, we were having great success. <laughs> and then the state decided, no, we're going to make it even more strict for you to test out. And so now we have students that are more, more in, um, we need to provide more services to, but we don't necessarily, it's not like we should be, <laughs> because those students were doing fine that were getting into the level one and level one. I would urge this district to again challenge the state and say this <coughs> this is not right. If we can prove that our students are are succeeding, why are you arbitrarily setting a different cut score that that causes us to have to provide more services? Not not that that's necessarily bad. It's just you, let's fix a problem that's a problem. Let's not create a problem that isn't the the real problem. From my understanding, the it wasn't just the state that made the decision. The WIDA is a good consortium of I think about twenty nine states, and they had met last year, and they that's where the decision came to make a more stringent standard to to exit the program. And I think that the reason they developed the more stringent standards is because they realized that students, second language students, maybe could communicate in. Um, English. However, their academic English was not up to the standard that it needed to be up to, and that's why they changed the test out protocol because kids may appear to speak English fluently, but that doesn't necessarily mean they have academic English mastered. And that includes reading, writing, and speaking. So, okay, but I'm telling you, if you look at those 302 students in 2013, mm -hmm they're doing better than the average students on those same standardized tests, which means that academically they are reading sufficiently. So I, okay. I challenge the, the rationale for their, for their change. And we now only have 110 students that are in monitor mode, which means we're, we're not testing anybody <coughs> out, right? right? I mean, so, so in 2016-17, that's when the test was changed to uh, online. So a lot of the kids weren't used to that format for of assessment. So if we dropped there, you saw us took a pretty good, you know, not too bad of a drop. But then when they changed the standards last year, that's where we took a huge drop. And it, you know, and it, it, it just goes along, you know, the red drops and the blue goes up. You know, that's just. Right, well, and next year, it'll be darn near zero because I'm guessing we're not having any students. I wouldn't them. say zero. Well, I'm just saying <laughs> it's a few, <laughs> right? Yeah, it, it's <clears throat> tough. It's, it, we're, in a, we're in a little bit of a pinch. And regardless, if you add the numbers together from each year, we have more ELL students. Regardless. Yeah. Whether they're in monitor or. Um, but I'm saying that chart makes it look much worse. Yeah. Well, yeah. just yeah. active wise. Yeah. It's, it's a it's hundred students, maybe more. Yeah. But the active students require more, they require more service. Which is my point. Yeah. We should be trying to reduce the number of active what students. Been, what we have been working on. This is artificially, our students haven't gotten worse. Yeah. Right. They changed, and that's they what changed was, that the was frustrating. analysis of right. whether they're doing well or not. It's not like the teachers changed the way they were teaching and <coughs> it's on its head. It's just... 24 into 11, 17, 17. Dr. Miritaka. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I'd like to follow up on, on Mr. Hallowell's comment. Uh, I do recall, you know, when we did ask the state, and by the way, when we say the state, in this particular instance, the state was the State Department of Education. <laughs> that State Department of Education has undergone a significant change in its constituency over the past four years. And I would suggest that if, in fact, Mr. Hallowell is correct, and I seem to remember that he was and is, it may be worth going back to the current State Department of Education and asking the question. I think we may get a different, different answer this time. It's a very different State Department of Education and State Board of Education. So, 
Mr. Coffin. Thank you. So, Mr. Chope, I have a question for you. With the increased uh, enrollments in ELL, now are they, they're not just Spanish speaking. I no. No, we've so got how many languages refugees? are you working 58. with? 58. Okay. So, is there a budget? I'm going to ask the budget question since it's going to come up eventually. So, is there a, bu a budget implication to to this? Have you yeah. Are you in the process of figuring it out? I won't we're, put you on the spot. We're, uh, we're, so, an increase in, in staff would certainly uh, leave a lot of pressure. The teachers are carrying a caseload of around, some of them up to 60 to 1, 50 to 1, which is pretty much out of whack. Um, when I first wrote our policies and procedures, I think in 2006, we were, we were trying to keep it 30 to 1. Uh, I redid those, I think, two years ago, and it, that was no longer realistic, so I was hoping for 40 to 1, and we're not even keeping close to, to 40 to 1 right now. So some, uh, some more staff to relieve the pressure on the ELL teachers would be great. Do you have an estimate? Are you talking three, five, or more teachers? Or or are these I would have to look into it deeper than, you know, to really give you a number. You, you but know I we're going to ask you for that at the budget. I would think more than three. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Dr. Yes, thank you. Since you did ask a budget-related question, uh, is, budget. some, is some of that funding federal? Yeah. Like title funding? But I can't hire teachers with the, it's That's Title Three, which comes, there's a an allocation with each student that's active or monitor, um, but I, you can't supplant what you know the district is is uh, uh, supposed to supply the teachers. So the Title III funds are more for things like after school programs and summer school, and because it's the, the district's responsibility to to sta sufficiently staff for the, so the program. So sufficiently staffing the program then uh, derives from <coughs> the district's operational budget. So it would probably be worthwhile to see if we could get relief, as Mr. Hallowell had suggested earlier, <laughs> from the, the state. Thank you. No, I was running, I was running this meeting. You still running this meeting? He's running Sorry. Meeting. No, I, I thought he said you were just doing the first part. So. No. Okay. Oh, no, no, you're <laughs> running the whole thing. No, no, left no, it no, open. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. So do we have the ability for each of these students to use a different cut score? Not currently, no. No, no, no. I mean, do we have the data for each of these students that we could determine what that chart would look like if we had to change the cut score? It's difficult. So it's difficult to figure that out because with the, with the change in the standard, so like say a, a, a student got a composite score of a, a three last, you know, two years ago in, in 2016. If they got a three this year, that we don't know what exactly where they improved or how they they calculate the improvement or what they did better on the test, even though they scored exactly the same. Yeah, you know, the raw scores. right? And mm -hmm. I guess yeah, you'd have to look at the, the raw scores. And we do have files for every year uh, of the access test. But again, if this I don't know exactly how the what is it psychometrics or whatever it is, and I don't know how that works for 2017. And just one other 16, thing, 17. so just doing the numbers, so we were running somewhere between 1130 and 1170 in all those years you see it, yeah. that number being flat, and the last two years it went to 1225 and then 1305, so yeah. it's about 100, 140 students. Yeah, we had been testing out, you know, basically about 20%, we were close to 20% for a number of years. Um, and then we, we dipped down a little bit to like 17, 18 percent, and then the big tank was 16, uh, 17, 18. that was where things were. And sorry, and so, so, just, sorry, I hate to harp on this, but this is really irritating to me that they did this. Because what you're doing is you're taking students that may not need that level of service, and if we can't come up with the money to extend it, you're stressing all your teachers. Yeah. And who you're hurting is those kids that were on the bubble that you're trying to get up, so you're hurting everybody, right? Yeah, I, I, I can only guess at the, the rationale. I really don't know what the rationale for them, why they changed it. I mean, I, I know, like uh, Donna was saying, the, the uh, research says the academic language really kicks in after seven to 11 years. That, that have been, they've been increasing that over the years. For a while it was, you know, three to five. 
now it's up to seven to eleven. So I'm, I'm assuming that's why they, they they're trying to give this, these students more protection. But if you run the which I think you have, you've run the data and found that the monitor kids were performing quite well. I don't have an answer for that. Did you ever receive an answer back from the state? I don't letter? think we did. We often find that we don't get receive an <laughs> answer back from the state. So maybe this new administration would actually answer questions from boards of education. That would be nice. And I carefully point out that it's not the state legislature that did this. <laughs> well, if we want to go into that list, it might be much longer. <laughs> So you didn't receive anything back? I don't From believe that. Is that I, I don't Did you have a question? You didn't receive an answer to your question back to the Board of Education? From the State Board of Education? No. Well, I think we sent it to Virginia Berry. It's probably going to be sent it to. Well, she was Lane, what did she do? No, this was a couple of years. It was three years ago. Well, three years ago? Mr. Farrington has a question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Howell makes a lot of the points that I would I recall the, the conversation about how well those students did better than our uh, non-EL students. If you will. The the cut score is one thing, but then you were also concerned whenever we transitioned to the online test two years ago about the impact that would have. Was it it was it the impact you thought it would have the first year, and I, I, we've done two years of it now. I think we dropped. I think. The, once we went to online, I think it dropped to 12 percent from like 18, and I, I believe that that's directly related to going to the technology. And you think I, it'll stay at that level at 12? I don't know. I and well, we've been using Title III funds to purchase Chromebooks because I want the students to get much more comfortable sure. with with technology because that's the way life is going. Yeah. So we've been, you know, filling up the department with Chromebooks. Hope you know, getting them hopefully getting them more used to the using it the technology mm -hmm. we have the software at the elementary level imagine learning which is a, is a way to get the students again using technology i think it will have an impact probably maybe for another year or two but as as we get more com they get more comfortable with technology i think that we can remove that aspect of of trying to figure out what's going on um because they'll just they'll be used to taking the, because all of their assessments now are most of them are moving toward that so I, that's how we tried to uh, address that that concern right there. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I, I remember watching some of the students the first year when they were using the, they they the one girl over at Lead Street. They had a recording that they would listen to on the headphones, and she finished up and took her headphones off and said, "That guy was so nice." <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was very funny. So, I mean, they, I mean, yeah. they didn't understand the concept of yeah. what was happening. Uh, Ms. Hans, I was wondering if you get results back, you get scores back from these tests, yep. can you ask the state again for more feedback on to where we did well, where we did well? We could probably, we could, we have, it's a very extensive file. It's not just, you know, full five scores. There is, there's all kinds of different information in there. And I think if you, you know, we really wanted to dig into that, we might be able to find some of the answers to the questions because it's, it's quite a large, there's a lot of information on what we, we get back from WIDA. Might that be something that Kathy Wild could work on when she did it with IRA? Sure. Because if we break it out, we'll know where to attack the problem. Right. And maybe we can get yeah, the, the test. There's a, we get a lot of data back. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. that might be something. We could figure out where we're falling short on this new test and then somehow recover if we know where our, our shortfalls are. Sure. Any other questions? Moving along? May I ask a question? Yeah, sorry. Oh, we get, no, no, it's procedural. Typically, we like to end at 7.30 or 2 hours. So are we planning to stay longer? Because um, then does it make sense to start your next section? Uh, I have something I, have, I would like to ask about. If it needs to be at the next meeting, that's fine. But um, I just want to understand well, the time. Well, this, this is the second time we've tried to present this information. So um, I don't know. I would prefer to... I would prefer, you're the chair, to go on. If, if, if I were, <coughs> if I were actively chairing the session, I would actually just poll the the members to see if they'd be willing to stay. Well, I said I would like to stay. Would you like to stay, Mr. Coffin? Uh, I think eight o'clock would be fine. Uh, okay. I think if we go beyond that too much more, I think we're going to lose steam. We right. also have people here that want to also contribute as well. 
So can I leave just... Well, I have something that I would like fine, to bring up also. I want to be sensitive because there are, you know, there are principals and administrators and teachers and curriculum coordinators who've also contributed this as well. So I just, does that work for everyone? I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't? I have to just go for my children. Okay, yes, that well, that's, um, does that work? Thank you so much. Well, I, I think so what, what it is is that they do? wanted to, they, to they wanted, well, I wouldn't say present. I, I think there is a commentary to some of the slides. I know the last time we left off, there was some discussion around where we got the data, some of the schools that, uh, we have some principals here that like to share some of their experiences in terms of pre presentation of data. And not that there's something um, that I think it puts what those numbers look like into a better context. And certainly, I think there were some questions around, uh, Mrs. Uh, Van Twyver had some questions around the, the data teams within the buildings, and certainly I can talk about them in generality, but I think the people who are really doing the work and really kind of moving forward, unfortunately some of them are leaving the room because of the timing piece, but I think it really provides a better context. I mean, if you really want to know what happens in data in, in our schools, uh, the people who are closest to it, the people who are working with kids, the people who are, are, are on the front lines every single day are right behind us. All right, then I suggest that we continue until we satisfy your request what, well, what, satisfied in what way that these people have an opportunity to express what they want to I I think eight o'clock I think is appropriate you think it would be I right. think it, in respect let's of let's time. move along then and uh, we'll try to keep it to eight o'clock okay so as we talked about last time we talked about the whole child so looking at all data sources and all the things that impact students and one of the things that we're seeing an increase in is trying to meet basic needs for students in terms of their safety, um, self-esteem, before we can get to the higher levels of learning. We have more and more students coming to us who are experiencing trauma, who are coming from uh, challenging environments. So before we can get to some of the higher level uh, expectations in learning, this is one of the things that from our guidance departments to the teachers in the classroom, building a community and a welcoming uh, environment is critical to get kids prepared and ready to learn before we can have the higher level learning begin. So can I just you, wanted to. Can you, sorry, can you just go back two slides? Can you go back to the first it's slide? Not the ELL slide again. What's that? Not the ELL slide. No. Oh, this one? No, this Old one. child? No. Um, I, don't, I, I read this quote. Um, I get what you're saying about there's a, there's a set of students that what you're talking about is an issue. I have a real problem with this turning away from student achievement data that's right in front of us. There's all kinds of things we can learn from that data, and so it's not an either or situation. So I guess this quote was put in here, so I'm going to respond to it, which is this, this is something that really concerns me. Um, test data is not just, and then, you know, I, I know what you're going to present, it's not just the end result mean score of the of the particular level. It's got to do with where did they start, where did they go to, it's got to do with what things did they know, what things they didn't know, a lot of the stuff that Kathy Wild has worked on to try to look at what components aren't being used. So I hope that's not a philosophy that this district is thinking where that's what we're moving towards, because that would be bad, I think. I don't think it's one or the other, it's and. Okay, yeah, if they turn away. I mean, that quote was chosen for a reason, I guess. So it's, um, maybe it's not the best choice in the quote. So. <clears throat> but I'm just saying we should look at all data sources, all things. And I think um, student achievement data, we should look at those annually, the summative ones that come up. We look at iReady three times a year, but we should also have other data points that we look mm -hmm. at in a more regular uh, way. I would like to know what those are eventually. I've asked for that before. <laughs> In June or prior to June? Uh, the no, next time you report on data. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to speak to some of the things that we're doing, uh, social emotional growth and helping kids. Aside, aside from, you know, the standardized and summative learning that happens, we've had more and more um, students that are coming with some anxiety-related and oppositional behaviors. We have a number of schools that are doing some book studies on that. More and more s schools are doing zones of regulation in terms of teaching kids how to self-regulate and manage them their emotions and um, be ready for learning. We have a number of um, schools that are working with Mike Anderson in terms of handling disruptive students. Um, but here are some of the things of 
what we do to help kids grow as young citizens and young people. And I guess if I could just switch slides here, is that okay? If yeah, I just speak yeah. to one other thing. Mm -hmm. um, what we're looking to do, and if you look at most of the research around looking at data, the first step is organizing for collaborative work. And as I spoke about or earlier, some of those data teams at the district level um, haven't been consistent. So we're looking to rebuild that data team, provide some leadership, do some planning around data sources. And there are great documents that were produced before of an assessment calendar, when do we assess kids? Then data collection after that, when can we collect all the data? And then when can we sit and analyze it and give it out to the schools? So some of that is just revisiting good practices that were in place before. Uh, to what Mrs. Hohensee and others were talking about with Mr. Chopa, uh, there was decisions made not to have a data collection or a great tool that does that. It's like a great tool, but it is a tool of Performance Plus where we can look at the WIDA testing, where we can look at SBAC testing and do some deeper level analysis that um, is not available to us right now and also has a number of other features that would be beneficial for the district in terms of having data collection right now because we don't have a centralized place where we can store that data. So, so are you suggesting, are you suggesting we're, we, you'd recommend that we buy software to do something? not technically software, it's an online uh, component that comes from the state. So it's looking at state data? Uh, it can be state data, so SBAC, NECAP, uh, can work with our iReady data. It can also work for some of our reading assessments, like K-5, we do Fontes and Pinnell a benchmark, so those scores can be in there. We do an early literacy screening, those can be in there. It's so I guess of a, something it's you've kind of a done... Deep. It's kind of a data warehouse That's for fine. all of so our data. My question, is this something you're considering? Is this something the district has done in the past? It has done in the past, yes. Has that, I've never I, heard I, of that I have either. to ask board members, <laughs> has that been, re the faces say they never saw it. So. so for a period of time it was free from the state and some districts opted to use it or not. And then, it, of course, like everything else, free. What is this thing called again? Uh, Performance Plus. Can you uh, send out some information on mm -hmm. that so we can become more familiar with it? Mm -hmm. And is there a test site that we can access to see what this reports? I don't believe so, but I can ask. Okay, thank you. And now it, there was a cost, so it was like $28,000 at some point last year when it was phased, or the year before that. And one of the two administrations, I think the previous administration made a decision not to uh, utilize that. So while we can do a number of things of it in-house, what we would like to get to a point is where we triangulate data where we can verify that things are happening um, in more than one testing environment. So if there's a weakness in math, we can show that in iReady and SBAC and maybe another data point. So a software package or a subscription, 28,000 a year? Yep. A year. Annually. Yes. Photos of Pinnell, the ratings are Mm. scores or whatever. Do we have records of that in the district? Can, well, can, can we go to a given school and look at the third graders and say the I-Ready scores indicated this, SBAC indicated this, Fontes and Pinnell ratings were uh, the principals What you just speak. talked about, triangulation. The principals can speak to that. Right now we, we just started last year, our first year. This year we're looking at uh, school-wide uh, school organization of that data and then next year looking at data collection district-wide. So to your answer to your question, yes, at the school level you could see those scores. And I think the principals could speak to how they're used in terms of um, one year's growth in reading, targeting kids for intervention, utilizing some reading programs. That was, that, that was instituted, at, I'm sorry, I'm gonna override you. I that was, that. <laughs> well, turn around, it's fair I know, play. Fair play, right. fair play, Go ahead. Okay, that was instituted last year under Dr. Um, Connie? Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown? Yes, ma'am. It was. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, can I <laughs> Sure you can. <laughs> so in the schools, they have the ability to look at the Fontes and Pinnell ratings and look at the i ready tests and the SBAC, and they can compare all three of those and say, yes, what we're getting with i ready agrees with SBAC, or it doesn't agree at one of these three phases. Can they do that? Because that should be data analysis, right? Yes. I'm getting a different question. What's this? Well, I was going to ask one of the principals to speak to that, oh. but also there's a, a fine line between the benchmark 
sure using it for data analysis, but it's very useful for classroom teachers because it's not just about the score, it's about the behavior and the habits of that reader. So do they need help in fluency, vocabulary, comprehension, word study, and then use that information to form small groups and do targeted instruction. So um, would you like to hear from yes. people on the ground floor? Yes, yes? I would. Uh, okay. Do we have a principal that could speak to Fontes and Pinnell, Iready, and SBAC? Um, would you like me to speak to, I, I, I kind of put something together as a broad breaststroke of all of it, if you don't mind, I would take them, are you, are you okay with that, Dr. McKinney? Oh yeah, yeah. If that's what you want to do. Okay. What you want to do. And would you um, like me to sit at the computer, or do you want to? I can, I can handle clicking for you, it's not a problem. So what I thought might be helpful um, is I understood your objective to kind of understand how at the building level we utilize data, how we do it. Not specifically how is it, what are my scores at my school, but how. So um, I threw together a few slides that Dr. Uh, is going to put together. He's going to put and it, it you gets to your question. Um, it, it will speak to your question about the be benchmark assessment as well. Okay. I think to take it kind of out of context to the broad stroke that I just put together for you, um, it makes more sense to capitalize that way. Excuse me, could you please remind me of which school you're right there? Oh, thank you. I'm from Maine Dunstable. Uh, my name is Kelly Terry, by the way. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. I know the name. <laughs> You're in my district. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, what I put together is kind of, when we look at data, we look at the entire assessment pool rather than one drop of data. So I wanted to illustrate it this way. So uh, you'll see that I put the main categories. The, these would be the, the pieces that you talk about the most, I think. So I wanted to put it that way for iReady, SBAC, Science NECAP, and the benchmark assessment system. But I. Uh, certainly would be, be remiss to not mention other pieces of data that are other drops of data that go into that assessment pool for each child. The classwork, exit slips, writing prompts, quizzes, and all day-to-day -day kind of pieces of assessment that the, that the teacher uses. Because when we look at, for us at the building level, it's really how closely can we bring data to the eyes of a child. And it's taking everything and saying, what do we know about this child holistically? with all of these things. Are we seeing the same thing from all of our pieces of data? Do we see an anomaly from a certain piece? And how does it all come together? So we look at the whole assessment pool. Dr. McKinney? Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so first, I just wanted to mention, of course, we all know about the SBAC. Um, the purpose is different for different assessment tools. So the purpose for SBAC is obviously summative. And it's our accountability to the state relative to the performance on, on common standards. Obviously, as public institutions, we are accountable for how our students perform toward whatever standards that our state has. And that's the point of the SBAC. It's, it's summative. But isn't that rather late in the year when you get that? It is not formative. Well, the child goes on whole. before. Correct. So who gets the data? The previous or the new teacher? Uh, the new. Okay. The new. Can I speak to that one sec? Yeah. They're saying with the new state assessment system that we'll get results within two weeks after the kids. Well, that would be a blessing. So the hope would be that we could have those results by the end of the year, look at them, and then give them to the teacher in the incoming year. Right. Dr. Mayotaki? Yes, thank you. A very quick question about the SBAC at Maine Dunstable. Yes, sir. So since your, your data team has been looking at the data, and presumably you also had <coughs> the NECAP math and ELA scores to mm -hmm. also look at. <clears throat> I, I, I remind everyone that I and others have been warned by the State Department of Education that the first two to three years worth of SBAC data should be considered as experimental. So those of us that are used to the nice, stable outputs that came out of NECAP, mm -hmm. we now have this disjoint period of two to three years where you, you could expect anything to come out of the, the data and that maybe the, the third or fourth year and on would be more stable, but there's this period where, have you noticed anything unusual about 
the first two years, three years worth of SBAC data that did not tie in well with the kneecap data that led up to it? It's apples and oranges. It's very, the, the information you get from SBAC is very different from what um, we got from kneecap. Mm -hmm. um, I think if, when we get hidden, get into a few slides, it'll, I'll be able to answer that question better okay. because it'll, it'll explain that a little more. So uh, when, we look at our, when we look at data at the building level, we look at cohort data and we also look at grade level data. So I put this slide together as an example of when we look at cohort data, we see the girl on the left. When she was in third grade, let's just look at her, the ELA performance for that class, okay, for that grade level. 64% were proficient. And now I'm going to just jump to Dr. Mutar, his question in a second. So that pr proficiency level is lower than probably what we would have experienced on the ECAP. So, um, so that little girl's class, uh, as third graders, 64% were uh, proficient in ELA. When that same group went to fourth grade, it went to 66%. And when that same group went to, fourth, to fifth grade, it was 72%. I tend to color code my data with my staff. Um, if there is a 5% change, if that's considered st st statistically <laughs> significant. <laughs> so I color code it red if it goes in the negative direction and green if it goes in positive. If it's less than 5%, I keep it the same. That's just, and this is actually a slide I used with my staff, so um, I just wanted to put it that way. We've only had three administrations of SBAC. Uh, I'm going to go back to Mr. Hallowell's comment about the um, ELL data. Mm -hmm. I already also changed its cut scores along the way. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to, and so it's an example again, and we, we may be aware that the SBAC is now changing to a different I, uh, item yeah. vendor, or however the wording is for mm -hmm. that, it's changing new. So I would, I'm not convinced, or I may, I just don't know how that is even going to line up with what we've got for the past three years. The benefit, it's not going to, right, the benefit of taking a state, the state assessment because it is a, a summative assessment, the real benefit is looking for trend data. Well, it's hard to establish trend data when you've only had three years and you're going to switch, or, some, or the cut scores get changed to some extent. Okay, so um, I just put the other uh, example to the right of that boy's class. Before you go to that example, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. The 5% that you're using, yeah. Is that just a number you're using, or is there a re rationale behind in, the In five my percent? training, when we do, when I learned about doing data analysis, 5% was considered a statistical significant value. So, so it's just the way I tend to look at data and color code. Okay, well, usually you'd figure out the percent by the looking at the standard deviation of the actual data. Yes, you so, can look at it that way, or your own performance shift. I'm not answering you. I'm sorry. Uh, but I, I mean, the, the, the standard analysis is to use the standard, you know, one standard deviation yeah. would be significant. It, so, but we don't know what the standard deviation is on no. any of this data. Well, we could, but we don't have any. Yes, Dr. Mitchell. Yes, well, if, if I could sure. get a couple of follow-ups. <laughs> so, <laughs> one, one question that I have for you at Maine.Civil is that you mentioned apples and oranges, mm -hmm. and, and you're, you're absolutely right. We as board members often have to respond to uh, challenges from the voters. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is usually associated with the academic performance as measured by some of the tests. Yes. The SBAC we know went to serious heavy duty testing of psychometric data. and. One criticism that the SBAC and the park have received is that it didn't tend to concentrate as much on academic achievement, which is in, in the past what summative testing has tested. Have you noticed that that is in fact the case at Maine Dunstable with the SBAC? So that's the first question. So the t the tests, when we go back to the kneecap, it was far more cut and dry, I guess I want to say mm -hmm. to that. The application of a um, multi-step of what you have to do on the SBAC is so different. Mm -hmm. So the stamina for a child to be able to carry that out and do it with the technology end um, is in itself a, its own learning genre. It's its own testing s setting. So we, would ha we spend time teaching children how to approach it. and. Um, I, I think that's what's coming to you. Like the line of questioning is just different. 
it's very different. The, 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 ter the term we use for this, by the way, is grit. Yes. <laughs> grit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're measuring grit with the aspect. Yes. Okay. And yeah, I just, in sensitivity to the time, do you mind if we just I, keep one, rolling? One, one more quick question. Oh. Because, because of the way you've been presenting this data, the, the next question, I think, is that the state used to require summative testing using their testing, their mm -hmm. tests, at grades level 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 11. Mm -hmm. It's now being suggested that you could get by with 3, 5, 8, and 11. If you did that at Maine Dunstable School, would you lose this kind of ability to analyze cohorts with the summative testing? Or do you think you could get by with 3, 5, and I guess by the time they're 8, they're out of your, your system? Okay, so wow. That's now you're asking, like, if I were in charge of the world question, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't have anyone. That's what happens me. when you sit at the table. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's a struggle. I mean, honestly, I'm not speaking for, I'm speaking for all of us. The test, Smarter Balance, has changed mm -hmm. um, in how we look at things. So could we do without fourth grade taking it? Fourth grade would say yes, because they also are hit with um, a couple other tests that others haven't had to take before. Um, we would have still iReady. We still would have all the other drops in the data pool other than Smarter Balance. Smarter Balance, we look at that profile to look at our programming and to say, are we meeting their needs in our programming? We do look at individuals, but we also balance it with the other drops to say, how is this child really doing? Because for some children, when they go into Smarter Balance, they start clicking and moving on. And they're not doing their best. Whereas when they're doing the reading with the teacher, she's monitoring and really checking in on what is he capable of? And what does he do in class all the time? So could we do away with fourth grade? Yes. We would get a check in third, a check in, four, in fifth, and we get a sense of how is our school doing. Um, it is going to be difficult, because when we mention the change of the test this year, they're shifting a big part of the hands-on part. It's not going to be there. So the numbers are going to be different, and we're not sure how that will play out. And do you think the middle schools could do, do without six and seven being tested, only eight as an exit out of middle I, school? It's hard for us to talk yeah, in middle school. Right I mean, we're elementary. Yeah. That's how we're all. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. OK, thank you. Wait, sorry, it's Dr. Mosley, and you, you were both, were you agreeing or disagreeing with were you saying 6th and 7th isn't needed? Sorry. You no, know, I said that it would be nice to have the middle school. They're just not here tonight. But oh, okay. Sorry. I yeah. couldn't speak to that. Um, in the interest, um, I, I just want to say, Dr. Mutarki, I was excited when I read that that option might be on. So I'm glad to, that you agree with me because I thought, yeah, I don't think we need it every year. Okay, thank you. Okay, why don't we skip, uh, why don't you keep going? Okay, stop right there. So um, what I want to mention is that whenever we have a major assessment and you see along it, then what? What do we do with that? We, we drill down to what are we going to learn from this? So from SBAC, it, you'll see that it says concepts and procedures on that chart. It, we learn about the targets. What can we gain from this? It is so summative. What is our gain? So we look at what they, they can provide us for reports, such as something like this, and then try to say, are there trends in um, what we see from different grade levels. Are we seeing the same level of performance on these targets that we saw from year to year to year? So then what? And then if you go to the next slide. But does that um, look, that looks at not individual students, that looks at a class? That's um, that looks at, a, yes, a grade level, okay. a grade level performance, which is um, then what? Then we go and we look at how did each student perform and when we look at that, and then we look at his, the other drops in the assessment pool, are we seeing something that we, re we want to make sure we're not missing? For We look at every single student with this and, and talk about them within our PLCs um, and make sure that we're, we understand everything. So, okay, uh, I, Donna? But sure. I'm sorry. I'm just no, 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 that's all right. Time. I understand what the yes. clock's right. But you discuss individual students, but you mm -hmm. look at the data relative to individual students? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Can I just speak to one thing about that? Can you go back to two slides? No, I can't. Just going back to this mm -hmm. slide? Uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, what you were talking about performance plus, in talking with Kathy, one of the challenges have been getting this level of uh, targets and claims for 
um, district-wide grade level, even down to cohorts within a building without Performance Plus is going to challenge because the state pushes those reports out into Performance Plus for you to retrieve them. So we've gained access and she's been able to get some of that material, but uh, uh, that's another reason why having a platform like that is very helpful. So you can't do it without Performance Plus? And Not to the level of detail that Kathy would like in talking with her. If they're selling it, they don't want to give it away. Yeah. Well, they were giving it away for a while. Now I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Uh, another major assessment that we um, have given historically and for fourth grade, as Trisha was mentioning, is a science kneecap. And the purpose of that, again, is summative. We get very little from it in, in terms of formative assessment, but we do try to, with all of our assessments, say, where, where's our yield? What, what can we do with that? And again, we're accountable to the state for the standards on that. Isn't the problem with science kneecap also that they change the focus areas that they have students tested on? The domains so are the one, same. I heard, I heard people agreeing in the background. Oh, so don't they, don't they don't they have different like there's one year they focus on astronomy. The performance task is changed every year. She focuses on a different thing for the performance task, but the overall test focuses on all the domains. Okay. Um, this is our a historic look that we just looked to say because the science kneecap is not one that changed its cut scores. So we can go back and look since the beginning time for science kneecap and say how are we performing holistically on that for the percentage of students that are are proficient okay don um you are, here's the domain side i wanted to mention so we can also pull apart how are we doing on each domain inquiry is the is the final is the end one and that's the one where they they change out the the i uh, will call it experiment um and what which domain it would fall for that correct um what was great about the science kneecap as we had it was that we could also, as we could in the previous kneecap, was look at released items and really tease down to that level and say what did the questions look like and how did, it, how did our students perform on certain questions. So then what we would do is take the released items questions, we would look at what domain that they were, um, that they fell in and the teachers teaching those domains would practice the released items with kids too. Um, just to as help with that part. the language in the question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because the way they ask the question, oftentimes that in itself would trip kids up because mm -hmm. they would think that they're answering it correct, but if they're asking for the opposite, like what was left out of it. Right. And so teaching them how to really be good test takers and looking right. at the language. We had the bound chart. Right. We had the bounty of that with the um, previous MECAP as well that we don't, don't have with the current state assessment to be able to look at released items because we found that that was very, very helpful. But then what would we do? We would talk about how did that student, how did these students perform? We sort them and see how did the, who's doing well, who didn't do well, did they also not do well in the previous other state assessment and on the other pieces of assessment <coughs> drops. Yes, sir. So just as a <coughs> quick question. So you basically stated what I think a number of us as board members and state reps have also noticed. With the kneecap, math, ELA, and currently science, mm -hmm. you as teachers could basically get, after the test was getting given, mm -hmm. you could get released what the questions were. And furthermore, you could also, before the test was given, also be able to look at sample tests to basically help to understand which domains were being tested. That is not currently the capability within either the park or the SBAC. Uh, you're, you're correct about the park and the SBAC. We, we wouldn't have sample tests from um, NECAP, but we would have released items. Right. Certain items that were very helpful to them. And it wouldn't be the whole test. Right. right. No, I understand Certainly. that. Yeah. And, and that's going to be the case because everything is computer adaptive now, so we will right. never have all of the test questions ahead of time anymore because they are adaptive to responding to how the student performs on it. Well, we were also told at the state legislature, directly in response by both PARC and, and SBAC, was that the questions were proprietary yes. mm -hmm. and that the testing agencies were highly competitive with each other. Yeah. and therefore would not release that information no matter what, no matter who. 
which is, I think, why the state changed to the assessment system we currently have. Garth can speak more on that. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. That, I'm glad you made that point because we discussed that quite a bit. Okay. So I ready is obviously yeah, a just a oh I'm so sorry. Man. I just wanted to say we passed a policy that was a little bit divisive, but I wanted to make sure that principals could see those tests. And I talked to, I think it was Dr. Scott Manti at the State House. Before the new commissioner, he wasn't the friendliest person up there. After the new commissioner, he couldn't fall over, over himself fast enough to be helpful. So I think there's been a sea change. I don't think it's his personal, you know, change. I think it's the department is more receptive to understanding. And he made it clear that you, as a principal, can see those assessments. The smarter balance. If I understand correctly, we could at some we could reach out and see a s specific students. That's correct. But not re That's it's not released items. It's, it's not right. released, but every parent has the right yes. to. So they can it's send it down to you. You would have the parent come in and you could observe it. But we t have a policy that we did. We pass that. I thought. I we, don't think we passed I, that. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. We'll not have to check it. Said we passed the form of it, but let's, that's, please, can we we're not, not going to solve that. Tonight. Can we not <laughs> talk? Saying, let's not bring this up again. We've had discussions and discussions and discussions on it. Okay. I'm just trying to inform so, the principal. I was just going to say that with that's the new always. state assessment system coming out of the consortium and them not owning all those questions, there is the hope that at the state level we'll have more information around the questions item analysis, more detail than we've had before which, with other which, questions. Which consortium? The NECAP consortium or the SBAC consortium? Or? So the new state SAS is called, is replacing SBAC. Okay. <laughs> Actually, and NECAP is all. And you finally thought package. you knew all the acronyms. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> well, if you got to change the name to protect the innocent. Exactly. You know? Thank you. Plausible deniability. So yeah. obviously, iReady is another major assessment. iReady is formative, not summative. So it's a First, it helps to inform domain-specific instruction and identify where students are relative to the Common Core State Standards, and it helps to measure progress over year. It's a very different type of assessment than an SBAC or an ECAP. Um, I won't belabor this, but just know that we look at data from iReady. Uh, we look at uh, whole, this is a whole, our whole school pyramid. Um, in math, for example, this was our, on the left, you see our fall pyramid for our school. And on the right, you see the spring, and hopefully you see the pyramid change, and you see where um, tier one, tier two, and tier three people are. So we look at where we started and where we ended. If you go to the next one. Can I ask sure. on, on where you end, and I'm not sure what those are, but I already has different levels. They, they have, if I recall correctly, they have the beginning of the year, mid-level, and mm -hmm. end of the year, and frequently in the district, we, we measure where students are if we, if we want to look at it that way, mm -hmm. referencing the test at the end of the year referencing the mid-level, mid mid-year point, unless that has changed. No, so I could have inserted a third in the middle and I could have done a mid-year one as okay. well. Okay, but, but at the end of the year, I think a lot, of, a lot of our older data has been referenced to how many students are on grade level, for example. Mm -hmm. It's referencing the mid-level score, not the end of the year score. It's not a, not a big point. Okay. Okay. So we look, and if you look at the next slide, just know at the. Can't say, sorry. sorry. Mm. So this is I ready this presentation. Is yes. Okay. Okay. Tell me, tell, tell me what those triangles <laughs> tell you. <laughs> nothing. Sure. They tell you nothing. Well, the, the, the presentation of that data is horrible. It doesn't help you it understand helps us, your data. Um, it helps us. Well, I wanted to say it does help us as a school because we look to see how does our pyramid shape out. Go to the next slide, and it might help. Um, this, for example. Now, um, it's a snapshot, so it may be a little blurred, but what it takes us to are the domains of instruction. And that's, this is how we set our goals. So this is a math slide in the fall of 2016 and in the spring of 2017. So in the fall of 2016, we look at our domains and we say, okay, what, what for every grade level we can do this. And then in the spring, I'm sorry, in the fall we set goals based on the, the data protocol that Dr. McKinney shared with you at the beginning of the meeting this evening. And in the spring, we look and say, how do we do based on the goals that the teachers set themselves? They look and based on the domains. So the first pyramid is, is not the, um, it's just a piece of information that is helpful for us to look at. We can, but it, now it drills down and we get to things that are more meaningful. So I agree with you to that. But I also think for us, it's, we, it's helpful for us to see what our school intervention pyramid looks like. So if you, um, the teachers, however, 
also yield reports on their own that they go immediately to as soon as they um, administer a benchmark assessment. They get a class profile that they can't wait to get their hands on and more specifically the individual student reports. So the teachers really d delve into that as well. And so the I rating lets us get down to very small pieces Correct. of curriculum, right, as to what they may have missed. Correct. So we can look at a student in fourth grade and look back and see that in the second grade they didn't get fractions at all, which is probably pretty common among second graders, um, since most adults don't seem to get fractions either. Um, and that, to me, is that's the value of iReady. It's mm -hmm. not some broad score, right? It's, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that CAPI has done. I mean, I think much better than iReady has done. Go ahead, Mr. Farrington, okay. then Mr. Coffin. I, much like the time for this meeting is running out, so is my time on the board. And um, my request has always been, I understand that every building has their own way, they, they deal with data, I mean, you'd be foolish not to, to ignore all of this. But I think that we, for me, we don't want to confuse what the, the individual buildings are doing with data as opposed and against the responsibility of the board to know what is happening in our schools at our various grade levels and, and that is where my concern is that the board should be able to have access and should, needs to know this information because the board is ultimately held responsible for the success or lack of success for our students and uh, and so I think that this is great and I'm glad to see that you guys do this but I think for me it's a question of what does the board get to see uh, and how well they are informed as to what's going on and I and I agree with everything that's been said I say you know we, we want to look at as many points of data as we can to make sure that they're 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 consistent in the message that they're sending us. If we're reading at fourth grade level uh, at in third grade, if we're, we're a year behind or something like that, mm -hmm. we should be able to confirm it somewhere else, mm -hmm. and then we need to do something about it. So that's my saying, and now it's eight o'clock. And so I think one time I respond. I think I, I think well, can you respond to him first, and then I'll let you ask sure. your question. I think an ongoing dialogue would be helpful and when we build those calendars in terms of when the assessments are happening and when the collection is and when we report out we should have meetings like this and discuss those pieces of data and have conversations and raise questions and have the experts come and share what's happening there because the other piece that I put in your packet was all those factors around student achievement this district has a, a number of things in transition in terms of curriculum adoption and changes in uh, professional development. We want to look at all those things and have a conversation. So I think you know it as well as I do. I got I got a bunch of stuff that I want to talk about in that regard, but I obviously we don't have time for that. Well, so may I Mr. speak Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. So I came prepared with uh, June 26th at a Board of Ed meeting. Dr. Brown gave a presentation on iReady reading results for students participating in and after school tutoring. And I wanted to discuss that tonight because what the board was told at that time was that this was a very successful pilot and it should be continued to be investigated and, and uh, implemented. So I, in lieu of the fact that we don't have time, I would ask that this be put on the agenda for the next meeting, please. Which is when? Two I, weeks from now? I knew the date a second ago. Sorry. Can I make copies of that? Will you send that along? Or what's the best way to do that? Uh, I have it electronically. Well, I'll send it to you. Well, Here's a hard copy. It's December 18th. December 18th is the next meeting. December 18th. It's okay. just these three pages. Just one so of just top just, pages. First of all, thank you for coming. Minutes. I really appreciate it. I just have some time out of your, your time to be here. And thank you for all the work you do with our kids. I really appreciate it. Thank you for taking time. I, I just want to personally thank, um, you know, uh, Kelly and and, and um, just for just coming up here. I know it's very difficult to do that, and um, you know, um, we can always have a healthy discussion around data. Uh, I appreciate everything you do. Uh, uh, there are some great discussions that we'll continue to have, but from the bottom of my heart, and I know our kids are on public. Really, thank you for all the work you do every single day. Uh, with our kids so I really appreciate the time you spent here away from your families I also recognize that we ran overtime and and trust me um, you're it's not falling on deaf ears I appreciate your time and thank you I'd like to request those um, 
overheads, if you would, please. If you will send them to... Um, Dr. Kenny has them. You have them, Dr. Kenny? They need to be part of um, the presentation that we put online. So, and, and you had one um, one slide that you presented that wasn't in the packet that we got tonight. Oh, okay, we did. And that one, too, because that needs to be all part of the minutes. Uh, yeah, we're not adjourned yet, so yes, Ms. Oancy. I just wanted to say, especially to the principals, that under policy ILBIS, they may inspect and review questions, and if answers are available, some are for different tests and some aren't, the suggested answers. That's in our policy, and the department is willing to work with us. And I suggest that we work with Kathy Wild to explore how best to analyze all this um, to data. And, you know, if it, if it meets that, that package, but we should put her to work maybe with Dan Donovan to come up with a proposal to how best we can move forward. And, and I'm so happy that everybody's, you know, on board. Mm -hmm. Something that's cost effective, she could do amazing things. If she's got limits, then maybe we go to that package. But I think she'd be the best person to say, working with IT, what we're capable of doing and what we're not. Okay. So it's great. I have one, one, one thing I'd like to say before we uh, adjourn, adjourn. And, uh, and that is that I am I'm very thrilled to have you folks talk to us like this and explain what you're doing at your schools, mm -hmm. like Maine Dunstable, <coughs> which is in my district. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm also impressed by is that as this new administration has taken over, one thing that I've noticed, and a lot of this is your fault, Dr. Mosley, <laughs> that the board actually receives these little notes from Dr. Mosley on a fairly frequent basis that says, aha, something good happened at this school or something terrible happened at this school. But we feel like we are included. And I think that when it comes to data and what's happening with our students in the school buildings, as you are going through your individual data teams at the different buildings, when you discover something that you think, wow, you know, the superintendent and the assistant superintendents and maybe even the board members really ought to know that something good is happening or something alarming is happening and just keep us in the loop. As we move into the new year, and you won't see me around very much anymore, but the new board members, I think, will equally appreciate this kind of transparency. And we would love, I think as a board, to be continue to be even more drawn in to your trials and tribulations <laughs> with, the, with, the, uh, with the learning and the assessments of our students in all of the different buildings. And so thank you very much for, for being here. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask that we get a copy of the, um, the, the assessment schedules. Can you get us a copy of that? I'd like to see when they are. I think we'll have to start making a list now. Maybe. Yeah, well, hey. <laughs> yep, I can do that. I would appreciate seeing that. And one question I would have liked to ask that maybe can be addressed at another time is the teachers have these things that they're looking at. Do they find that the results of those things that they look at differ greatly from what we see with SBAC and mm -hmm. iReady? Because if that's the case, then we need to have that information presented all the time uh, with, with the SBAC and the iReady stuff because when I look at these test results and I see that they're going down, it's not doesn't make me a happy camper. So if the teachers are seeing different results, mm -hmm. then I think that needs to be brought forward in a, in a public meeting. Yeah, we okay. have some teacher leadership here in the problem. Yep, yeah. and so um, you wanted to say something? Uh, we just asked the board and Mr. Hollow's comment of revisiting this letter that was sent or advocating at the state level because in sitting with the ELL department from January to June and looking at the assessment schedule for the new, which is basically SBAC and ECAP, and two sessions of iReady, and then the ELL testing, and you saw the number of kids that have to happen. Those students spend a considerable amount of time with assessment. So if there's anything we can do to alleviate that and advocate for them, I would greatly appreciate it. And I know Mr. Chopin's office would as well. I sent the link <coughs> to the superintendent 
of the New Hampshire Department of Education site that is associated with that question. Okay. I also sent a copy of the latest PDF file that the department distributes on things like, you know, exit from the uh, observational period. Mm -hmm. So the superintendent also has that PDF okay. file as well. Okay. Thank so you. the next agenda will include uh, Mr. Kaufman's uh, paper. I would request which, that it be added to the and agenda. Should, yeah, and if be. there's any continuation from this discussion, that it also be uh, placed on that agenda. And if you could send those um, um, overheads to us on the board before. But it also has to go into the minutes to get uh, Jackie. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'll do one more. Do you want a motion? Yes, please. Motion to adjourn. Okay. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And we are adjourned at 810. Thank you very much, people. Thank you very much. <laughs>